able to come up with that profile um, and see it there. Uh, separate for that, did you also test a, a number of different swabs or cuttings uh, as part of your work? I'm sorry, I did, yes. Okay. And with regards to those, I'd like to ask you about a couple of specific ones um, and by the initials that they came to you under. Uh, specifically, I'd like to ask you about swabs that you received that were labeled JMT 1, 2, 3, um, and 4. Okay. Do you recall being asked to test those? They sound um, correct. Uh, I do believe one of my reports had those numbers. I don't if you had a chance memorized. to look at that report, would that help? That would be lovely. I know you said you. yesterday, I, I believe you said you write over 60 of these per year. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, you may. I'm handing you um, uh, a document. Can you tell me what that document is? Yes, it's my January 19th, 2022 report. Um, and that, that's what it is. It's three pages of report. When you generated that particular report, uh, was the information fresh in your mind from the work that you just completed on those swaps? Yes. So I'd ask you to review it for a quick moment. Afterwards, I'm going to ask you a series of questions about a couple of different swabs that you tested on that day, okay? Okay. Just the JMT 1 through 4 swabs? That's correct. Okay. And I see you're looking up, so does that help refresh your recollection on your testing on those four? That does. I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about the results that you got from those particular swabs. And I'd like to start with swabs JMT 1, 2, and 3. Um, did you get any results from looking at those swabs? Right. So 1, 2, and 3, I did get results. They were from more than one person, but there was so little DNA that they were insufficient to um, be able to make any comparisons. Remember yesterday I talked about when you have a profile, it has to be good enough quality to be able to compare it, and if it doesn't reach a particular threshold, then we can't do any comparisons. That's what happened with those three swabs. And is that the same for all three of those swabs? There was just insufficient DNA in all three of them? Yes. Okay. When you do have a situation like that where it just is insufficient, um, does that mean that you can draw any sort of conclusions from it one way or another, that it's definitely uh, one individual or definitely not, or that it compares to an unknown person versus a known? Can there be any conclusions drawn? So we can, uh, um, usually we can tell at least if it looks like there was one person or more than one person, which in this case for those, um, all three of those, I said they were more than one person. And um, sometimes we can tell if there's an X or an X and a Y, and we can tell if, uh, at least one of those people is male or female, but in this particular instance, it, there wasn't enough information to even tell the gender. Okay. And for let's stick with those three swabs if we can for a minute, JMT 1, 2, and 3. For those uh, swabs when you did your testing, your testing on this, that was testing for DNA analysis, not for general serology. Is that correct? Correct. So uh, you don't know, or let me ask you, did you know uh, what sort of substance might be on these swabs or might have been um, swabbed uh, here? So I was, um, when, when I get the file, I do have information, some cases, some I don't. For these, I did by then know that they were, they were believed to have blood on them. And with regards to, uh, are you aware of whether or not they went through serological testing at the lab? So those swabs did not. They did not? No. Okay. And uh, I believe you yourself, you've done serology at the lab um, a couple of different times, correct? Correct. All right. And with regards to that, um, what's the name of the test that the lab does for testing for the presence of blood? Castle Mayer. Okay. I'd like to move now to JMT4, that last swab. Um, did you get a different result on JMT4 as compared to 1, 2, and 3? I did. And what did you see on JMT4? I got a profile from one person, and it was a male. It was from male? Male, yes. Not female? No. Okay. And let me go ahead and ask you, were there several other swabs that you tested in this matter? There were. 
And from those other swabs, generally from all of them, were you able to come up with any other known profiles or a, a, a profile that you saw on any of those that was one that could be compared specifically? I, I believe there was one other sample somewhere that had a female profile, if I remember correctly. Um, I don't remember if it was a cutting or a swab of something. If you had a chance to look at the rest of your reports, do you think that might refresh your recollection as to where that may be? Yes. particular one that you talked about that's not within um, the report that you were reviewing a moment ago dated January 19th. Right? No. Right. Do you recognize uh, the three documents I've given you there? Yes. And what are they? Um, my February 1st, 2022 report, my February 20, oh, sorry, they're out of order, um, a June 29th, 2022, and a February 21st, 2023 report. Would, would looking at those reports possibly help refresh your recollection as to the profile that you were able to see? Um, yes, yes. Uh, feel free for a moment to review and then let me know what Um, I think I was incorrect. There was a hair that was female, but it was not actually good enough for comparison purposes. Okay, so there was a hair that you looked at, but it was not suitable for comparison purposes. Right, and everything else um, it does look like you're correct. They were not anything that I could compare. Let me ask, with the work that you did do in this case, uh, at any point did you make anything called a, a cutting or take a separate sample out of what you had been provided? I did not. You did not. Let me just have a moment, please, Your Honor. Yes. Uh, Ms. Swangle, uh, one more quick series of questions. With regards to the known profiles you were able to develop, uh, not only the one um, for Adam Montgomery, but also the one for Crystal Sori, and then with this profile that you were able to see on the toothbrush, the one in 100 sextillion, um, with those three profiles, uh, were you able to, what were you able to do with that information? Is there a place where that goes, or is there a place where that type of information is shared? Um, the the only place that we would have to share anything would be with the um, with the national database, and the I believe the profile from the toothbrush was sent to them for um, as a for the missing persons portion of the database. Uh, that's my recollection. That was not something I did, but I believe that that is what happened. Um, and then the profile from Adam Montgomery was put in. Was well, put into, into that into database. database. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Swangle. I don't have any further questions for you. I believe Defense Counsel will have a few. Okay. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Fine. Um, I do have a quick few questions, <clears throat> and you clarified a few things for me. Um, sure, if you don't mind. Okay. Just let me know when you need to look at a report, and then... Um, the jury will understand that you're reviewing your report when you testify. Okay. So um, one of your first duties, you, you said that uh, you had two sort of roles in this case? For the most part, I did just DNA, but there was one report that I wrote that was serology. And that was in the beginning of January of 2022. That sounds correct. I believe I started it actually on the 9th of January that year. Okay, and that was because of... Uh, a whole bunch of stuff went to another criminalist who normally does serology, so you checked a few things 
um, to get them done quickly. Correct. So all the evidence came in um, and they were asked to rush it and it was a Friday, which is when they all hap happened to happen. And because I was planning to come in on Sunday, he did what he could on Friday and on Sunday I was tasked with um, trying to get these couple items um, in particular uh, tested and started for DNA. Okay, and so one of things that don't simply, let's take swabs where people think, uh, the collector thinks it's possible blood, okay? Yes. Somebody at a scene has collected a swab and thinks it's possible blood. Doesn't go right in for a DNA analysis, right? Not usually, no. Okay. It often goes to serology for uh, intermediate test to see if there's a presumption that it's blood. Correct. And if uh, it turns out that it's presumptively blood, it goes on to the DNA lab. Correct. And it may turn out to be DNA and it may not. Correct. And then if it is DNA, you may be able to get a profile or you may not. Correct. And if you get a profile, it may be sufficient to compare to a known sample or it may not. Correct. Okay. So these are all the steps that are generally happening in the lab in a case where swabs and samples go to the DNA lab. Absolutely, yes. Okay. And when you did your serology testing in this case, um, and I think the numbers on them were swabs BEO5 and BEO6? Yes, they are the correct uh, numbers. Okay. And one of those swabs was negative for blood. I believe they were both negative for blood. Okay. One of those swabs was negative for blood and sent on to the DNA lab. They okay. were they were both negative okay. and both sent for DNA. All right. So let's talk about, um, well, let's... Do them both together, you're right. Uh, BEO5 or 6 was negative for blood but sent on to the DNA lab. Both of them were negative for blood and were sent to the DNA lab, yes. Okay, but BEO5. Those are the correct numbers. BEO5 was yes. negative for blood and sent to the DNA lab. Yes. And then BEO6, you actually got a little more information in your lab, right? In the DNA portion? in the DNA portion? Um, that's the report that he took away. So I'm not, I think so, um, but it was not, again, it was still not comparable. Do you have 19 with you? Okay, so I have messed this up and I don't mean to repeat, but I'm gonna back up so that we have it. Uh, BEO, five and six were both negative for blood, but sent to the DNA lab. Correct. Okay. And at the DNA lab, you got DNA from BEO6? Uh, I got nothing at all from six. Okay. BEO6. So Correct. here's something that was sent to the lab, found not to be blood, but still sent on to DNA in BEO6, right? Yes. And then in BEO6, there's no DNA. Correct. And then BEO5 is sent to the lab, found not to be blood, but forwarded on for DNA analysis, and you did find DNA. I found um, a small amount of DNA, yes. And in that small amount of DNA, you found a uh, presence of more than one. That's correct. And you don't know how many. Correct. And you found the presence of at least one of those multiple two or more DNAs was male. Correct. And the presence of male DNA limited your ability to see female DNA. That's correct. So that um, that mixture could have been two males. Yes. Could have been multiple males. Yes. Could have been a male and a female. Yes could have been a multiple males and females. Yes. You just have no idea. Correct. So, um, and I want to talk about some of the reasons that might lead to that insufficiency analysis. 
uh, determination. Okay. Uh, DNA can degrade over time. Yes. And uh, you may two years later find DNA or not. Correct. And um, in this case, when you were talking about JMT one through four, were you aware of where those swabs were um, obtained from? I don't remember if I did know that at the time when I first started them. I'm not positive if I, if I knew or not. Okay, the jury has heard some testimony about the collection of those items from a trunk of a Sebring. Does that sound right? I know that there were definitely samples from the trunk of a car tested, so that would make sense, yes. Okay. Now, if uh, DNA is out in an what do you call the environment that you hold the swab in? Um, not quarantined. Um, room temperature? Okay. What, what are you, when I'm you not sure. When you store it so it won't degrade. Right, so they're just stored usually in envelopes. Okay, mm -hmm. and are they put in refrigerators or any kind of special environment? No. Okay, so when you store it, the DNA can degrade? It can, but if it's just at room temperature, usually it doesn't. Okay. But if DNA is out in temperature that goes from, could go from very, very hot for a while to very, very cold for a while, it can be subject to degrading. Correct. And, um, but at the same time, it can be subject to those swings in temperatures for years and not fully degrade, right? That's true. So sometimes something, some uh, DNA exposed to those extremes in temperatures you may end up with nothing, or you may end up with something. <laughs> That's true. Because uh, DNA can actually stay around for a long time. It can. And it is why even after years have passed, you test uh, for DNA and or blood. Yes. Okay. Now, the JMT1, 2, and 3 had the DNA, but they were not sufficient quantity. Those three, oh, sorry if I look, I'm sure. Oh, they're recording. Sure, please. Uh, 1, 2, and 3, right. I could tell that there was more than one person, but that was all that I could tell about those three. Okay, so again, we have that multiple that you had in um, BE05, right? Correct. And it could have been a male and a male? I don't know anything about the gender with, for that sample, whether it was male and male, male and female, female, right. male, et cetera. Right. All of those choices apply because there's only uh, two genders that are under consideration. Correct. Okay. And um, could have been all of the same gender? Could have been. Could have been all of mixed gender? Correct. Could have been two, could have been more than two. It could, generally, our wording is if we say more than one, it usually means we think it's two. If we think it's more than two, we generally would write more than two, et cetera. But okay. um, when it's very low, it is difficult to, hard, to tell for sure. Okay, so here it could have been multiple, but what you saw is more than likely two. It, correct, because okay. it's more than one, and I did not write that it's more than two. Okay. And um, in other, you tested a fair amount of swabs in your DNA analysis capacity, right? Correct. And um, they were swabs that had the initials M-E-R and various numbers after that. Correct. And the jury has learned that the initials are usually the person that collects it and the number is kind of the order that it gets collected. Right? That is correct, yes. So a fair amount went through serology, something was uh, deemed appropriate to send on for DNA, and then it was tested by you. Correct. And you said JMT you knew was from the uh, trunk, or you believed was from the trunk of uh, Sebring. Correct. I knew there were several things from a trunk of a car, yes. And nothing from the interior of the car, right? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any questions, Your Honor? Thank you very much. We'd ask that you just leave us to be excused, please. Yeah.
Any objection? I think not at this time. There's one more criminalist, perhaps, and then I will um, give an answer. That's a no. Yeah. Um, all right, you may step down, okay. uh, and you're not excused from the seat. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, do you swear that the testimony that you're about to provide to this jury will be the truth and the whole truth and that any of these penalties are appropriate? I do. Can I have a seat? Do you have a question? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
You mentioned uh, going into the juvenile division and working as a school resource officer. I did. How long specifically did you do that for? Two and a half years. If I, rec I don't really know exact. I think it was two, maybe two and a quarter years, two and a half years, somewhere around there. And you also mentioned uh, eventually becoming a detective in the juvenile division. I did. What did you do? What were your assignments and duties uh, in that role? Investigating crimes either against or by juveniles. <clears throat> and how long were you a detective with that division? Uh, I, I was just shy of 10 years, by a few months. Earlier you mentioned prior law enforcement experience, prior to the Manchester Police Department. Can you tell the jurors what that is? I worked at Hooks Police Department. That's where I was originally hired in 04, and I worked there from 04 to 07. Then I transferred over to Manchester. Mr. Riley, did you graduate from the um, New Hampshire Police Academy? I did. What year did you, did you graduate? The 135th Academy, and it was in 2004. I want to switch gears, Officer Riley, or I'm sorry, Mr. Riley. I'm still um, an officer, so it's okay. Okay. Um, can you, uh, were you assigned duties in your capacity as a law enforcement officer in the investigation of a missing child, Harmony Montgomery? I was. And can you just describe generally your role and involvement on that case? It began with everybody pretty much in the division because when it first came in, it was uh, was fast paced. They, they kind of grabbed everybody they could to, to work on it. So the assignments in the beginning were kind of just, they'd have like a morning meeting and they would decide you're doing this today. It wasn't, there was nothing specific. Um, and then it morphed into, I was assigned uh, monitoring jail calls, jail mail, jail messages. Um, I was involved in some interviews. I mean, there was, I had, I didn't have like a specific assignment. Whatever was needed, they just assigned it to us and kind of we ran with it. Did you say it was all hands on deck? It was in the beginning, yes. I mentioned a missing persons investigation. Did that change at some point during the course of your involvement? It did. Yeah. What did it change to? It uh, changed to a, more of a homicide investigation. Do you, recall, do you recall when your involvement began on the Harmony Montgomery case? I believe it was the two days after Christmas, so it would have been the 20, 12 27 of 2021, if I recall correctly. At some point in the investigation, did you and the officers with the Manchester Police Department receive information uh, pertaining to the Families in Transition Shelter, FIT Shelter, here in town? We did. Um, and what, uh, what led you, what information did you receive that led you to that that shelter I wasn't part of the there was an interview that was conducted and information was obtained that maybe that the child was placed in that apartment for a period of time you mentioned an interview being conducted was that with Kayla Montgomery it was during your your time with the Manchester Police Department were you tasked with processing that room I was when did you process that room I believe that was June 4th of 2022, if I recall correctly. <clears throat> can you can you describe your response to the families in transition shelter that day? Uh, we were just we were told to go out there and, and we were going to we were gonna complete a search of the of the apartment. I mean, I, the crime scene van was involved. I, it wasn't my case, like so I didn't really have like any of the planning. I was just kind of let's go, you're going to help process the scene, and, and we obviously went out there. So you mentioned receiving information pertinent to your investigation that may be at the Families in Transition Shelter. Did you, subs subsequent to that, after getting that information, did you provide a subpoena for documents to the Families in Transition Shelter? I did. If I can approach, Your Honor. Yes, you may.
So Mr. Riley, I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 93 for identification. I'm just going to ask that you review those items. Bring specific attention to this page and this page. Are you aware of what those documents? I, I am. I have never actually read these, but I am aware of what they are, yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, the state moves to strike ID as State's Exhibit 93 and to mark the spoke. Could you just read it?
and overruled in part. I'd just like to walk through what those documents are with the jury. If you could start with the, the first page, the, the room information. Feel free to use this if you need it. Do um, you see the individual's, the individual's name in the top left? Yes. Can you read that for the jury? Adam Montgomery. And what room does it say Adam Montgomery? Room one. And what were the dates associated with this day? December 30th of 2019 through February 20th of 2020. Let's go to the next document. This is work order number A11010. What is the start date of that document? 2-5 of 2020. What's your understanding of what this document is? It's a work order for the fit. And can you read the description on that work order? It says general other, really cold in units two and five. Come check the thermostat, slight odor when the heat is on. Done on two five of 20. And uh, what was the unit number associated with that? Unit two. And we'll talk about this later, but are you familiar with the general layout of the rooms in the fit shelter? Yes. Let's move to work order A, work order number A11079. Which unit number is associated with that work order? Unit one. And that's your understanding of where the defendant was standing? Correct. And can you read the general description? General, other, weird smell coming from vents in the unit, come check it out. And what was the date associated with? February 20, 21st of 2020. Okay. And you mentioned earlier that Correct. So this is the day after he arrived. Correct. If I may approach your honor. <coughs> Riley, I'm handing you what's been marked and previously published as State's Exhibits 31 through 34, and what's been marked for identification as State's Exhibits 35 through 39 for identification. Can you take a look at each of those in turn? I'm going to take these records back. Sure. Can you take a look at each of those in turn and describe what's depicted on those images? This is the, are you going to put them on the screen too? You want me to I plan to put them on the screen, but okay. if you can just, um, just this one. Talk, to, talk to me about okay. not, not sure the terms. Okay, so the first picture is a picture of the front of the families in transition, which I'm going to call fit for ease. That's uh, the front door. It's really just the front of the building. 
and the second is uh, second picture is uh, Hold on. Oh. Uh, Attorney Knowles it, him saying second picture I, I need him to identify what he's looking at by the exhibit right. number please the number that's depicted at the bottom. Is it this number right here? Yep. Okay. So number 30, number 30 is the front of the building. Number 31 is inside the building looking at doors, uh, apartments one and two. Number 32 is uh, looking inside uh, unit one. It's a picture inside the room. Number 33 is another picture inside the room, specifically of the ceiling. Number 34 is a picture of the vent, uh, our area of interest, one of them. Number 35 is a picture above the ceiling, looking at the um, an area of interest that I'm sure we're going to talk about shortly. Uh, number 36 is I had placed a uh, measuring tape to kind of show the size of the area that, of our interest up there. <clears throat> and then number 37 is a picture of the, the, the ceiling was cut and it was on the floor before they wrapped it. How about 38, 39, 38, 39, A and 39. So 38 is another picture of the um, ceiling when it was on the floor. It was placed on butcher paper. Okay. 39A. 39A is a picture after I cut the uh, ceiling, just the hole and picture of the room. And then 39B is another picture of the ceiling where I, I cut out the, uh, the ceiling. And um, do you recognize the items? I do. Are they accurate representations of what you saw that day? They are. At this point, Your Honor, I move to strike the ID from State's exhibit exhibits 35 through 39B. Not 30 through 34. Just 35 through 39B. 30 through 34 have been previously published. To make sure. I see. Okay. Uh, any objection? All right. The ID is stricken. They're entered as full exhibits. Detective Riley, when you were when you arrived at the Families in Transition shelter, were you accompanied by anyone that day? Many people, yes. And you mentioned uh, remembering going there. The image that I've just depicted behind you, uh, identified as, as States Exhibit 30. Uh, do you recognize that that location? That's the front of the fit. Yes. And the individuals that accompanied you that day, do you remember their names? Some of them. Um, Detective Stewart, Coswick, um, Ray Hill, uh, Deputy Duffs, uh, William Duffs is his name, uh, Tufts, I'm sorry, Tufts, uh, Detective Dunleavy, there was a couple supervisors there, I think. So Captain the individuals Layton that you just mentioned, the majority of them work for the Manchester Police Department. All, yes, all but one, yes. Are you aware of where Deputy Tufts that you mentioned? U.S. Marshals. Mr. Riley, what did you do when you arrived at the Families in Transi Transition Shelter, FIT Shelter? You mentioned that you, you did some cutting as you were reviewing those images. Can you tell the jurors what you actually did? So. You want me to start from my first observation when I walked in the room or just the actual cutting? Let's talk about walking into the room first. If you'll look at the image that's um, on the screen behind you, States Exhibit 31, what are we looking at there? Unit 1 and 2, the so doors. Unit 1, I don't know that that's much better, but. Yeah, this is 01. Can you, so Unit 1 is on the left, 
And where's unit two? Right here, on the right. So they're adjoining rooms. Yes. They're polar opposites from each other. They're, I'm pretty sure they're exactly opposite, like this. The walls are pretty the two. I'm sorry, you're on. Oh, yeah. Um, sir, you just need to speak into the microphone when you're speaking yep, so sorry. that everyone can hear you. I know it's hard, but. Yep. <laughs> and did you make any impressions when you, well, did you enter the room when you we, arrived? I did. And the image that's behind you, you said you recognized. That's unit one. And was that the layout that day? It was. Are you aware of whether or not they're allowed to move furniture at the families in transition? I have no idea. Tenants? I'm not aware. But that's what you saw when you arrived? Yes. And again, can you remind us why you were going there that day? There was information developed um, <coughs> in the investigation that there's a potential that the missing child was placed above the ceiling in this unit. And was there an access point to that ceiling? There was. And do you see it in the image there? I do. It's the vent at the top. That vent? That's correct. And there's a number next to that vent. Can you read that to the jurors? Number one. When you arrived in that room, when you actually walked in, did you make any impression? Did you have any impressions? I did. Can you tell the jurors what those impressions were? There was an odor. I couldn't, it, I could smell something. I didn't know what it was when I first entered the room, but I could tell there was an odor in the room. Okay. <coughs> Any other impressions, Detective? I mean, it looked lived in. I kind of a normal, kind of a normal residence, I guess. Did you do anything with that vent while you were there? I did. What did you do with it? I removed the vent. <clears throat> I pushed it up into the ceiling and moved it to the side. How did, well, was there anything uh, securing that vent when you moved it? I don't believe there's anything securing the vent to the like the outside frame, the, the vent kind of just sits into the outside frame, but the <coughs> vent was connected to some tubing up top by a zip tie. Did you remove that zip tie at some point? Af yes, I did, after. What did you observe when you, did you look into the, the opening that I you did. created? I did, I did. you observe when you? As soon as I removed the cover, I knew I could smell what I, I know is, is decomposition. I knew I could smell a dead body what I believed to be a dead body at the time, or it smelled like decomposition is the best way to describe it. What is decomposi decomposition? When a person dies, they, their body starts to, starts to degrade, I guess is the best word. It's, it's, it's a smell that you just won't forget. And can you just tell the jurors what your experience is with that smell? I mean, I've been to, many <clears throat> many death scenes many um, autopsies I've, I've smelt it many times did you make any other observations when you looked into that vent i did and what were those i could see at first that there was <clears throat> it looked like a stain right close to the edge of the vent <clears throat> that correct and I also noted that you can see the sheetrock dust and i'm sorry if you can't hear me this is hard to crank my neck around to see this um, the sheetrock dust you could tell had been altered. Like you could see in the back, all it's all fresh sheetrock dust, probably from when it, the place was constructed. And, and this over here appeared to have been something had been in that area. Mr. Riley, if you don't mind just standing up and actually pointing to that area of dusting that you're discussing, right here, you can see here. This is been, this is different. It's, the, the composition is very different between the two. It was clear that something was here and not placed over in this area. And the staining that you mentioned, where is that, if you could point it out on the screen? I'm sorry, say that again? You mentioned seeing staining. Yes. Where, where is that? Yeah. Yeah. At some point, did you attempt to measure what you were observing in that picture? To the best, yes, I did. And is that it? It is. About 16 inches across? Approximately, it varied in, different, in size. Let's talk about what you did next after you observed this area of interest. What did you do? We, as a team, we obviously decided that we needed to take, take this, so we, we cut it. We, we used the 
just an old school sheetrock serrated knife and I cut the sheetrock until I got to the to the metal uh, studs and then we had to use a reciprocating saw to, to cut the metal the metal studs you can see in the picture. <clears throat> Did you take any precautions while you were working on the ceiling? I, when I was up in there I, I had gloves on but I didn't go up into the ceiling you couldn't because it would collapse so I, I kind of I didn't really have other than putting the measuring there, I didn't really have any direct involvement with like the stain. When I started cutting, we we changed gloves every time we changed. You know, um, like when we took the vent down, we changed gloves. When we started cutting, I changed gloves. But I was I was below the ceiling at this point. I was cutting from below. I wasn't up in up in the ceiling with the. Were you wearing a hazmat suit that day, or I was mask? not. How about a mask? I was not. What were your working conditions like while you were while you were doing this? It was hot. It was hot. It was hot. Yeah, it was very hot. Sweating? I was. How long did it take? You said you removed a portion of the ceiling. How long did that take? Uh, I would say the actual cutting was probably maybe an hour. I, the whole time we were up there was maybe, or dealing with that, maybe three hours. I, I don't recall the exact times, but it was, a, it, was a, it was within a couple hours, I think, probably, from the time we removed the vent to the time we, we actually took the ceiling down. And so you mentioned actually taking the ceiling down. Is that what it looked like? It is. And again, that staining, did it become more apparent once you removed it from the, the dark area it was it in? It did, because of the lighting. It was... Do you recall whether that item was given an evidence number? I know it was. I, it wasn't tagged by me. My primary fo primary focus was just getting it down and then it was handed off to the to the team that packaged it and tagged it and I am helping assisting packaging later but initially they put it and covered it in butcher paper do you recall having it labeled MER 3d it sounds right yes MER those are initials this jury heard do you know whose initials those are yeah detective Ray Hill that's Max Ray Hill correct <clears throat> you mentioned butcher paper Yes. Do you see that in this image? Yes, it's, you can see it through the hole. It's sitting on top of butcher paper. At what point during your processing did you actually place that butcher paper down? I didn't place it down. The team that was there did. I, I was standing on, I had a, the ceiling, I'm not very tall, so I had to stand on a platform to get to cut. So once we got to the point that we could, I could cut the last metal, we had to have other team members hold it. And then once it was detached from the ceiling, I got out of the way and it was put down on a piece of paper. Do you know what the purpose was of putting it on paper? Preserve any evidence that's, that's on it or in it. Would that be including the items that fell during the cutting? Correct. <clears throat> Are you aware of how this portion of the ceiling was handled once it was removed, once you removed it? I know it was placed in the crime scene van and then I believe I helped carry it up into the uh, evidence room, and then I separate. I didn't have anything to do with it for a period of time after that. Were you aware of low points in the ceiling while you were processing it? I don't know what you, what do you mean by low points. Was it completely level, or do you know? On the outside, looking up, it was it was flat. Inside, there was, I mean, there was there was a bunch of different channels because of the metal framing. I want to talk about um, how large the ceiling was relative to the, over to the overall room size. Are you, you documented it, is that right? I did. And is that accurate uh, in comparison? It is. How did you actually get up there to, to cut this out? We used that bed frame. No ladder? No. Nope. Well, we had a ladder there as well because we had to have multiple people, but I stood on that bed frame. and If I recall, I may have stepped off to the ladder. And I know there was some talk about having other people jump in because it was hot that day and it was a lot of manual cutting but I, uh, I continued and just because I was already covered in sheetrock dust there was no sense getting anybody else. Mr. Riley I want to switch gears at some point um, in your official capacity as an officer with the Manchester Police Department did you travel to Florida? I did. Can you explain that to the jurors why you did that? They're trying to figure out how to get this to a lab to test it for DNA or try to figure out what was on this staining. And I know that I didn't myself, but another detective had um, had done some work on this prior to me getting it. I, I, I offered to drive it down to Florida because they had no 
it was too big. You couldn't fit it in a, in a like, plane. It was just, it turned into a mess. So I offered to, to drive it, and they said, sure. So I went and uh, <clears throat> rented a car at the airport. And I know that the size, it was, four, I remember it being 44 inches wide, and we had to find a vehicle that it would fit in. So we rented a car, and it fit, and we drove I drove straight to Deerfield, Deerfield Park, Florida. I think it's uh, DNA Labs is the name of the. DNA Labs yes. International? Yes, correct. And when you say we drove it, who who you who were who if anyone were you accompanied with? Uh, Detective Bergeron Rosa. <clears throat> and so you drove it from Manchester to Florida. We did. And do you recall the date of that? I believe that was July twentieth of twenty twenty two, if I recall correctly. Did you stay in Florida or did you come back to New Hampshire? We stayed overnight. <clears throat> we drove straight through. We didn't we didn't sleep on the way down. We drove the whole way. In your career as, as an officer, have you ever done something like that, such a large, long trip? Uh, personally, yes. Many times as a police officer, no. Did you eventually come back with that item, that portion of the ceiling? We did. And um, when you say we did, was that with Adam Bergeron Rosa or was uh, that another officer? That was with uh, Detective Heil. Heil. Yes. Just the timing thing, so they assigned him to go. And how did you come back with the item? We flew down and we rented a car, or it was a Ford Expedition, if I remember correctly, and we came back with that amongst many, many other items. It wasn't just that item, but the, the vehicle was completely full. Between the time that you... <laughs> took possession of the, the portion of the ceiling and the time that you got to the lab in Florida, were you able to maintain um, and secure possession of that item at all times? At all times, yes. And once you obtained it back from the lab in Florida and drove it back to New Hampshire, were you able to um, contain it, to secure it at all times? We were. If I can have just a moment. I'll be able to use this now. It's just, it was just hard to turn around. And right. <clears throat> it doesn't have to go high. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Caroline Smith, and I do not have very many questions, but. Um, <clears throat> Uh, you talked about having many different duties in this case, right? That's correct. And one of those duties was to talk with Kayla Montgomery? Yes. And <clears throat> do you recall when uh, you were speaking with Kayla Montgomery? Uh, I would say either either the 30th of December or the 4th, uh, I think 1230 of 2021. is. I may be wrong, but that's kind of in my head. Okay. Um, was that at a fit shelter or a recorded interview? Both. We, so I talked to her two different times, so that, that may be off by a day. The first time, I believe we talked, I talked to her. We were at fit, outside of fit. And the second time? Was at the station. Okay. And that was a recorded interview? Correct. And that was prior to her arrest? Correct. Okay. Um, did you advise her that she could have an attorney? Yes. And did uh, you tell her that she didn't have to speak? You wanted um, to talk to her about uh, missing Harmony? Yes. That, I don't know if I did or Detective Dunleavy, but she was advised that it was a voluntary interview, yes. Okay. And um, you talked for a while. Yeah. Yes, it was I think it was. And then at lengthy. some point, I think you all gave her uh, a chance to be alone and write down maybe her thoughts. Correct. In case she didn't want to tell you all um, directly, maybe she wanted to write it down and pull her thoughts together. That is, is that correct. Right? Yes. And the essence uh, is that when, and you gave her a fair amount of time, right? Yes. And when you came back and looked at the note, um, it essentially ended the interview. It did. Okay. Now, another random duty. I, I, I don't mean to call it random. Okay. You just it were was. jumping here, there, and everywhere, Very right? Very random. 
<laughs> and okay. one of the things that you did was, <clears throat> sorry, to collect uh, something from the House of Correction that Kayla wrote? Correct. Document. It's okay to remove it out of here? Yes. yes you have it. Okay. I do recognize it. What is it? It's a note that she had that was, I think they were doing a cell search, if I recall correctly, and they found this in her room. Okay. In her cell, sorry. Okay. And so essentially, uh, the um, police department, someone discovered that this note had been seized. Yes. And you were assigned to go and take the note. Correct. And um, did you talk to the COs and sort of document everything about how that was obtained? They, yes, they had their own report. They provided me with their, their inside report. Okay. And do you recall when that was? I don't. I'd have to see the report. I don't remember the date. I'm guessing early January. I just don't, I don't recall the date. I have to see it. <clears throat> if I showed you a copy of a report, would that help refresh it would, your it would. it would. It's just too many dates to try to I know, I know. wrap my head around them. So it was January 31st of 2022. From the time that you obtained that note, did you put it into evidence and secure it and all that stuff? I did. Okay. And just very, very quickly, I want to talk about securing evidence and why you do it, okay? Yes. And why you have these initials and all these bags and stuff. Um, you can't do anything about evidence and what happens and who touches it and how it might get transferred and all that stuff until you collect it, right? Correct. If you want to preserve something in the exact condition uh, that you want it to be in, you can't affect what happened before, right? That's correct. So all you can do is take what you have available and from that moment you can preserve it. Correct. Any changes an item might have gone through, any transfer of evidence back and forth, you can't affect that. I cannot. But the, from the moment that you, get, you collect it, you're going to make sure that there's virtually no changes in that item, right? Correct. And one of the ways that you do it is to um, collect it and put it in a container. Correct. Okay. It might be something like an evidence bag. Could be. And it might be um, something more, it might be an envelope if it's just a document. Could be. Yes. And in that one, you uh, put it in that clear evidence bag? I believe this was their evidence bag, but I, I, I don't recall if it's ours or theirs. This doesn't look like our, our bag, but it may have been. We have many different types, so I don't recall if this was mine or theirs. Okay. I, it probably was ours because I believe I took photograph. I mean, uh, copies of this, so I believe this, this would be our bag. I okay. may be mistaken. And that's a plastic bag? It is. So you try and collect it and preserve it in the container appropriate for that evidence. Sure. For instance, you wouldn't put the tile in plastic because that might cause um, condensation. Condensation and affect sure. the condition of the item within there, right? Sure. Yes. But you're not so worried about condensation with a piece of paper. Correct. And then when you collect it, uh, the jury has seen items open, and it has uh, red tape. This one is sealed just as a product of the bag it's contained in, right? Correct. But other evidence items might have some tape on it. Uh, sure. And the reason for the tape is that you are securing the evidence and letting anybody know once this is taped, that nothing is going to change that item unless we can track it, right? Sure. For instance, 
if evidence has been taped with uh, Manchester Police Department tape, then something might be sent to the lab for checking, right? Sure. And the lab would have to open an item to test an item, right? Correct. And so when the lab opens whatever packaging that you have uh, retained a piece of evidence in, they actually don't open from the top, right? I don't, I don't do that. I have no idea how they open it. Sustained. Okay. So one of the purposes of the different color tapes is to be able to track when an item of evidence has been opened from its packaging. I use whatever color tape is available. It's not, it, I don't use it for tracking. I use it to seal the item. That's the only reason I do it. Okay. So if somebody comes along later and opens the item, they have to reseal it to indicate uh, that it's been gone in and then keep the tracking. You don't do that? Overruled. I don't, I don't reopen evidence. I don't know that I, I mean, I okay. guess it's possible it could happen, but I wouldn't necessarily use a different color tape if I did. Okay. I would, I would, I would cut it in a different area. I would tape it and then initial it after. Okay. So you would cut it in a different area so that somebody knows that it has been opened from the original ceiling. Sure. And then uh, you would tape it in that second area, right? Sure. And you would do a report that documented the fact that for whatever reason you had to go into the bag that contained the item of evidence. Sure. So that anybody that wants to know, has there been any changes to this item of evidence, we can track anybody who has had access to it. It's reasonable, it. yes. Okay. Um, but there's nothing you can do about anything before you collect an item of evidence. Correct. Okay. Um, Thank you, Detective Officer. Yes, Officer. <laughs> Officer Riley, you were asked about interviewing Kayla Montgomery, and you mentioned that that interview ended. It did. Can you tell the jurors why that interview ended? She said that she didn't want to talk anymore and she wanted to get an attorney. She asked for a lawyer. She did. Note G, uh, Exhibit G, that note that was collected. Are you sure about who collected it, who put it in that plastic bag? I'm not, I'm not, I don't, I, I think I would have because I believe I took photocopies. I don't recall if I did photocopies or they gave me photocopies. That's why I'm unsure whether I put it in that bag or someone else. When you say they may have given you photocopies, you also said it may have been their bags. Who, who is they? Uh, the they that you're referring Valley to? Street Jail, Hillsborough County House of Corrections. Note G also talks about her wanting to speak to her attorney, right? Correct. You were asked about the handling of evidence, packaging, um, you were asked about cross-contamination. Do you know what cross-contamination is? Yes. Can you tell the jurors what cross-contamination is? Uh, well, it depends on the item of evidence, but, I mean, cross-contamination could be anything from blood to DNA to... I mean, I'm not sure what... Specifically with respect, I, and let me back up. You were asked about tiles. Did you, did you collect tiles from that fit shelter? Tiles? I, so we, it, they were collected, yes. I didn't physically collect them, but yes, they were collected. You collected the ceiling? Yes. And this wasn't ceiling tiles, this was the actual ceiling? This was, this was a drywall, yes. Do you remember what the drywall was connected to? It was connected to metal, um, metal studs, metal framing. Metal framing? Yes. So that's what you collected? Yes. Um, after that collection, did you volunteer a DNA sample? If needed, yes, I did. Why? Why was that? Because it, it was it was we were sweating so much it was nearly impossible to to try to measure and take pictures of that stain. I mean, it was just the sweat was running down my face, so I I I wasn't sure if I could have sweat and drop any in that opening when I was up in there. 
is that pretty standard when you're collecting items of evidentiary value, of potential evidentiary value that you volunteer such a thing? Yes. And that's for many detectives, correct? Yes. I don't have any additional questions. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Um, the uh, prosecutor asked about how the December 31, 2021 interview ended and with that note. And you said that Kayla asked for an attorney? Is that the, the recorded interview? Yeah. Yes. Yes, she said it. She wrote in the note that she wanted an attorney. Yes. Okay. But the note contained a lot more than I want an attorney. The note contained what she said yeah, what her story was. Yes. That Adam had driven off with Harmony and she... Approach. So the note that essentially entered the interview included that she wanted a lawyer, right? Correct. But it also included that she didn't know anything more, go talk to Adam, he wouldn't talk to her. Yes. Okay. Uh, sorry about my misreference to the ceiling tiles. So it's um, okay. Uh, And again, that volunteer of the DNA sample is a lot of stuff can affect an item, and you want to make sure if there's an item of evidence uh, that is revealing information that nobody understands that they can check your DNA, compare, and see maybe it's that versus something else. Correct. If there's a question about perhaps DNA being found. Correct. Okay.
And by the way, note G that you collected from the COs. Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. That was not the note we're talking about in the interview. That was the note where Kayla had listed her uh, desires in talking to the AGs. Correct. Okay. Thank you. You may step down. Yes. Our mid morning break. It's about 10 33, so just after a quarter of, we'll come back uh, and resume the evidence. Thank you for your attention. All of my instructions uh, apply today as well. So don't talk about the case, please. Thank you. I'll rise for the jurors, please. minutes so 12 for you all <laughs>
be seated. You may be seated. housekeeping matter okay. for this next particular witness. Um, uh, with regards to the next witness, the state's going to intend to call uh, Detective Brandon Lammy from the Manchester Police Department. Uh, this will involve some handling of the pieces of evidence, especially some of the larger pieces of evidence. Um, one of the evidence technicians that happens to work for the Manchester Police Department, David Dido, is present in the, in the courthouse today. Uh, we would ask if you would be able to just simply glove off and be able to help handle some of those materials. Um, for Detective Lamy rather than having Detective Lamy do all of the work himself, because we will be talking about some of the largest items that we have. Any objection to that? I don't think so, no. Okay, and can he stay in, during cross and Absolutely. do the, I think that's do the, the same thing? Absolutely. To, to, to be impartial in terms of his ability to assist the jury in understanding the evidence. So if you, if you want him, if you don't, uh, I'll leave that to you, Attorney Smith, but he'll be available to help manage the larger pieces of evidence if you want that, okay? Um, all right, that, that's fine. Um, maybe just introduce him. You know, he's not testifying, but I think it might be useful to, for them to know who he is. Okay, very good. Um, all right, uh, ready to bring in the jurors? Everybody ready? Yes, yes Your Honor, sorry. <laughs> Oh, I guess maybe they'll take it out of there. The cart, yeah. The cart will fit? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. You may be seated. State may call its next witness. Yes, Your Honor. The state calls Raymond Lamy. In addition, Your Honor, we'd like to call evidence technician David Dido, simply to be able to assist with the handling of the physical evidence, uh, not to testify. Any objection? Not objection. <coughs> Raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony that you're about to provide this jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Okay. You can have a seat, make yourself comfortable. There's some water there. <coughs> And Detective Lammy, if you can get started by just stating and spelling your full name for the record. Ray Lammy, L-A-M-Y. And uh, Detective Lammy, how are you presently employed? I'm currently employed as a detective with the Manchester Police Department. How long have you worked as a detective? I've been a detective uh, a little over five and a half years. And what's your current assignment? Uh, my primary function is fraud investigation, and I also am a lead in crime scene processing. 
What are your current duties and responsibilities, Detective Lemmy? Um, <clears throat> general investigations of any financial crime uh, from start to finish. Um, when it comes to any major crimes in the city, violent crimes, then we all lend a hand and process those and work on those together. Have you ever had any other roles at the Manchester Police Department? I was a patrol officer for just about five years. And prior to that, any law enforcement experience? Two years in Litchfield as a police officer. Did you graduate from the New Hampshire Police Academy? I, I did, uh, class 163, um, approximately February, March of 2014. Detective Lamy, do you participate in regular training as a function of your, your role with the Manchester Police Department? I do. What generally, what types of training have you completed? Um, notwithstanding a litany of financial crime investigations, I've done um, forensic identification of skeletal remains, um, blood pattern, blood stain pattern analysis, crime scene processing, death investigations, um, FARO certified, and crime scene photography. You mentioned the FARO just now. Can you tell the jurors just generally what that is? A FARO is a, a 3D device that um, can map out an area. Uh, which is useful for documenting measurements and recreating a scene for the jury such as yourself. I want to switch gears, Detective Lamy. Um, were you working in your official capacity, in your official capacity as a detective rather, were you assigned um, to a particular case involving a missing child, Harmony Montgomery? Yes. And can you just generally describe your role and participation in that case? Um, majority of my role was uh, helping coordinate evidence processing, liaison between uh, the state lab and private labs, um, processing of several vehicles uh, for evidence, and also some other various items that were processed. Did you coordinate with a lab in Florida during your participation? I did. And when did your involvement begin? This, this um, matter? The beginning of January, we had some initial tips that were phoned in that we went and investigated in Haverhill, Mass. And then some uh, a vehicle was processed uh, middle to the end of January. You mentioned the beginning of January. Do you remember what year that was? 2022. You mentioned tips, and I want to discuss that. Are you aware of a tip line related to the disappearance of Harmony Montgomery? Yes, I am. Had you worked... In your career as a law enforcement officer, as a detective, had you worked on a case involving a tip line before? I've had, I've had tips come in for some of my own cases and financial crimes. I'm, I guess I'm referring to a specific, a specified tip line associated with this case. I did not field the tips or the calls. I was just asked to follow up on them. You were directed to follow up on them? Correct. And you said one of those was in, did you say Haverhill Mass? Yes. You mentioned processing vehicles mm -hmm. during your participation in this case. Was one of those vehicles a blue Audi AS4 bearing New Hampshire registration number 4569334? I can tell you that it was an Audi AS4 blue. I can't tell you the exact plate without referencing my notes. Your Honor, if I may, <coughs> excuse me, if I may approach. Yes. Detective Lamy, I'm handing you what's been previously published as State's Exhibit 22 for identification. Or for, yeah, identification. Uh, do, you can, do you recognize that vehicle? It's the one that I processed here at Manchester Police Department, New Hampshire Plate 4569334. And that's the that <coughs> Yes. <coughs> Were you working with other officers and detectives during the processing of that vehicle, Detective Lemmy? I was. And how many days, roughly, did, did it take for you to process that vehicle? The physical processing of the vehicle took about three days, and then there were additional days after that processing the evidence that we took out of it. Was it, was it consistent? <clears throat> excuse me. Was it consistent with individuals that were assisting you during your processing of that vehicle, or did the members change? 
the members changed a little bit? Do you know a Detective Heil? Yes. How about a Detective Pittman? Yep. Uh, the two of them and I were responsible the first day of basically inventorying the vehicle, um, identifying the majority of the evidence items that we pulled out. And this jury has already heard about the, the initial processing as you take in evidence. But Detective Pittman, do you know what his initials were? J JP. And the items that you collected from that vehicle, were they processed under a specific set of in initials? Yes, JP. <clears throat> About how many pieces of evidence, potential evidence, were, were labeled with initials during, during those, your time working on that body? Um, under the, I would say it's approximately 271. Separate from that, did you use any testing during your, your processing of that, Audi? Yeah, um, after the first round of testing, or the first round of um, processing the vehicle, a few items were tested um, with a method known as a hemostick. And a hemostick basically is a, a reagent on a strip that when comes in contact with hemoglobin will turn a, a dark green. Did you test all 271 items using a hemostick? No, we did not. Why not? We essentially looked at the items on um, what appeared to have potential for yielding some type of blood or DNA. Are you aware of false positives occurring with the use of a hemostick? Yes, I am. And can you explain that to the jury, please? Uh, the, the reagent on the hemostick, um, can get false positives, which will trigger it to appear to react as if it came in contact with hemoglobin, which is found in blood. And some of the items that can do that are potato, tomato, iron. Um, they can give you a, what you would think to be a positive, but it ends up being a false positive. Because of false positives, Detective Lemmy, when you, when you see something that's presumptively positive, um, what do you do with it? The presumptive positive is just a, an, an indicator that it could have hemoglobin, so we, we treat everything as if it has the chance to have that. Um, in this particular case, the items that tested positive were sent up to the New Hampshire State Lab for processing. And I guess let me ask this, do you take additional swabs to send up to the, the New Hampshire State Lab? Depending on the item, um, I believe in this case the items were small enough that we were able to send the whole item up to the lab. On this particular vehicle, where did you use the, the hemostics? In the back seat, there was a car part um, just randomly sitting on the seat, and it was plastic with um, car insulation, like sound and in deadening insulation on it. And there were a couple of spots on that that looked suspicious that I tested. How would you describe, <clears throat> excuse me, how would you describe the condition of the vehicle when you examined it? So the vehicle had what appeared to be, and we didn't test it, but it, it smelled like it, um, appeared to have a, a thick layer of mold all throughout the inside of the passenger compartment. And you previously mentioned working on that vehicle for several days. Did you take any precautions because of that? We wore Tyvek suits and also um, not wanting to breathe in mold, we wore a face mask. Of the items that were pulled from that vehicle, did you send any off to the state laboratory? I did. And do you remember um, which items you submitted? The, the first three items that we did initially were, um, I believe, JP55, which was the car part, JP120, and JP122, which were carpeted floor mats. <clears throat> Do you recall submitting item JP 119, 153, 195, 224, 251, 216, 225 to the lab as well? So those were sent several days or a week later when we processed outside of the vehicle area. And I actually used a different testing method for that one. 
What was that testing method? I, so I transitioned from the hemostick to Castle Meyer, which is a similar type of test. It's um, processing using reagents to also identify hemoglobin. Um, but the Castle Meyer historically has been known to provide less false positives. So I, I transitioned to that and processed approximately 37 items that had come out of the car. And out of that, I believe six gave me a presumptive positive and uh, one was a false positive. When you say that one was a false positive, how did you determine that? So, and not to get too technical, but the way the test works is you drop um, three drops on a swab. So the swab is used to collect the evidence off of the item. Sometimes it's a dry swab, sometimes it's a drop that's been dipped in sterile water. Um, you rub it on the evidence item, then you drop uh, a couple of drops of what's called phenolphthalein onto the swab. If the swab immediately reacts with just those initial drops, that's considered a false positive because until you add a couple of drops of hydrogen peroxide, 3%, onto the, the um, item, it shouldn't react at all. So in one of the cases, it reacted as soon as I dropped the first couple of phenolphthalein drops onto it. <clears throat> Excuse me. You mentioned this uh, green color when you're using hemostics. Mm -hmm. Is there a color associated with the Castle Meyer test? Yes, the Castle Meyer will turn to bright pink. And is there, are, is there a different level of pink that you're looking for, or is it something else? It's not so much the level with the Castle Meyer test as it is the, the time frame of how long it takes to react. So if it, if it reacts immediately, it's a stronger indicator that it's a true positive. Can you still have false positives with, well, I think you mentioned that you did in this case. Yeah, you can still have false positives with the um, Castle Meyer. So it's, it's just a presumptive test that gives you an indication, let's look further at this. So detective, I wanna switch gears. I wanna discuss uh, processing of a portion of a ceiling. Are you familiar with what I'm referring to? I am. And can you just generally tell uh, the jurors what your involvement was with that? Certainly. Um, so I was aware in my conversations with the team that a, a large section of ceiling had been gathered. Um, I was also aware that that piece of evidence had been sent up to the state lab for processing. They processed it for different items um, and did not come back with enough evidence to support there being DNA on the item. Um, I was told by members of the team that they sent a couple of these pieces of the ceiling down to the private lab we mentioned earlier, DNA labs in Florida, to have tested. And they came back as um, testing positive for blood. At this point, Judge, I'm say. <coughs> Sustained. I'll redirect, Judge. Um, so I don't want you to get into the specific testing um, of any of the items, but just uh, what you did. You, could you explain that? Um, okay. Your Honor, if I may approach. Yes. I'm showing the defense what's been marked by identification of state's exhibit 40 through 51. <coughs> Excuse me. Detective, I'm handing you what's been marked for identification. Identification of State's Exhibit 40, Exhibits 40 through 51. And I'm just going to ask that you uh, review each in turn and then look up when you're ready. Okay. So are you familiar with those images as well as what's depicted therein? I am. And how are you familiar with them? I took the photos. Okay. Um, 
are they fair and accurate? They are. And again, you took these photos? Yes. Are they consistent with what you saw the day you took them? Yes, they are. All right, at this point I move to strike the, what's been marked by identification as States Exhibit 40 through 51. Without so objection. Full. Without. Without objection. Uh, the ID is stricken. They're entered as full exhibits. They may be published to the jury. Thank you. I'm going to take them back. I'm going to put some up on the screen. We'll go through them. So you mentioned being tasked with processing this item. Are you familiar with the item number associated with it? MER 3D. And when did your processing occur? July 15th, 2022. Specifically, what was the item that you were tasked with processing? The MER 3D was um, the, a large section of ceiling tile, which was sheetrock with um, some metal strips on the top of it. And so those images that I asked you to, to look at, I've put one up on the screen behind you. Can you explain to the jurors what they're looking at? Yeah, this is the whole piece of evidence um, as I examined it that day. And you're essentially looking at a, a center opening that I believe is where um, a vent was but I wasn't present when they removed this item. And the metal pieces you see are the strips on the top part of the ceiling. You wouldn't see this from underneath it, but that's what the sheetrock would have been mounted up to. And when you, you say you weren't present for the removal, is that from the, the location that it was taken from? Correct. The shelter, the fit shelter? Correct. <clears throat> and so what does this image depict? This, this image is evidence. Um, I requested that the item be, that I examine the item because we didn't, well, I, I won't speak to the lab results, but I, I requested that I review the item to see if I could find any potential traces of evidence that we should be looking for. So the evidence technicians brought this out for a viewing. Um, I viewed the item. I noticed things on the item that made me suspicious that there were additional areas that we should be testing. Detective Lemmy, let me ask you this. When you received the item from the laboratory, was it packaged up? Yes. And so it was, this is how I found it at evidence. The evidence technicians brought it out. They opened it. And this is how I found it. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Detective Lamy, I'm showing you it's been marked for identification as State's Exhibit 108. Are you familiar with this item? I am. And what is it? It's a, a hand sketch that I made of the ceiling. And when we discussed your processing of that portion of the ceiling, how did you process it? So the, the entire physical piece, as you see it here, was brought into our training room at the police station. It was placed on um, two work tables with that side face up. It was removed from the evidence bag that it was in and placed on um, butcher block paper on the tables. Um, then we went through the process of basically dismantling the metal pieces from the sheetrock. And let me stop you there. Mm -hmm. 
going through that process of dismantling the metal framing from the sheetrock, was it important to keep track of what was coming from where on this, this object as a whole? Yes. So because the whole piece was it entered into evidence as one evidence number, um, once I was going to start dismantling it, I attached my own initials and numbers to each piece that was then separated. So when you attached your own initials, did you still preserve the earlier initials? So uh, MER3D and then your initials following that? Correct. And so this item that I've just shown you, um, why did you create this? Well, other than having photos of it, this helps to show where the positioning of each of the items was. It's not to scale, um, but it shows where the items were so that we could have a better understanding. Did you create this as a demonstrative to show where each piece came from? Yes. Each of the pieces, I think you mentioned this, but you gave a specific evidence number of its own with your own initials attached. Correct. Is this a fair and accurate representation of the sketch that you created? Yes. All right, at this point, I move to strike the ID of State's Exhibit 108. Mark is full and published to the jury. No objection. The ID is stricken. It's entered as a full exhibit. It may be published. And so I've added the image to the screen behind you. That states Exhibit 108. And I want to discuss the items that you that you packaged or that you that you removed. You mentioned the railing. Did you remove any other items? We we separated several of the pieces of the sheetrock from the the main unit. There was one large piece that I ended up keeping intact, um, but then we separated off parts that didn't appear to be um, important as far as any potential evidence items on it. And you mentioned taking the photos. Did you give those photos specific evidence numbers? Yes. Did you provide a description along with each of those evidence numbers? I did. And so can you explain to the jury what they're looking at here? So the, you know, and I'll point up here if you, if you can't see, let me know, but I just put a tape measure on it just to see what the distance was between the metal grids. Um, on here, there's also a couple of handwritten letters written right onto the sheetrock. That was not done by me. I presume that that was done by the state lab. And there's what appears to be a, a dark stain in the center of this piece of sheetrock. And so the letters that you're referring to, if you can just read them for the jurors. Far left is the letter A next to that um, cutout. B, cutout. C and D are in the, the stain area. And when you received this item back from the state crime lab or the state forensic laboratory rather that had already been done that's not something that you did during your processing that's correct so this item is MER 3D RL4 can you describe what uh, what the jurors are seeing in this picture RL4 is the metal um, grid that runs across here it's it was sitting on top of that dark stain, and it's lifted up on edge, so flipped up on its side. And there's also dark staining on the metal itself. And when you say that dark staining, did that become an area of potential evidentiary value during your processing? Yes, it did. And I just want to show the jurors where that item 
MER 3D RL4 came from. Do you see it depicted on the, yeah. the sketch you drew? So RL4 is this section that runs completely across the larger piece. And in this smaller box, it's right here. And what's depicted in this image? This is still part of um, MER 3D RL4. It's the other end of the piece, and it's also showing dark staining running underneath that grid. I want to move on to RL14. What's depicted in this image? RL14 ended up being a piece of the sheetrock that we separated from the main piece. Um, it's separated approximately at where this line is, and this is the, the dark stain on the sheetrock itself that had been under RL4. And I want to look at where that came from in relation to the, the portion of the ceiling that you processed. Can you just um, point that out on your sketch? Yeah, so RL14 is this section right about to here. Um, over to about this line that extends from here. And what does this image depict? Um, RL16, so this line right here would have been where RL4, that long strip that runs across, and then RL16 is another section of sheetrock that we separated from the main piece of interest and approximately at where that thin line is going across that's where we separated that piece from during your processing of mer 3d did you become aware of low points in in or warps essentially in the the drywall and framing area i i can't tell by looking at it the way it's laying on our workstations if the item would have been angled when it was sitting on the ceiling itself. But what I can tell from looking at this where there was a dark stain in that center and then you see a much darker stain running um, along that railing, it would appear that the fluid that would have made that stain would have run along that, which is not uncommon for fluid to track um, an object that's attached to it. Did the fluid, the staining, appear to be absorbed into the drywall? It appeared to be absorbed into the drywall more in that center area where it was a lighter color. And then it didn't, it, it was much heavier consistency along the, where the rail had been. And what is depicted in this, this item? this image so, so this is still part of where RL4 was sitting on top of it and this is just a, a shot from the side of the piece to show that there's depth to the staining itself at the time of your processing detective Lemmy were you aware of other testing that had been conducted on this item at the, the lab I was laboratory and can you tell the jurors what that is uh, so the those two square cutouts that you saw on the sheetrock itself where the paper was missing those two had been cut out and sent down to the lab um, as part of the state's processing of the item and the results came back Objection, you're saying sustained not asking you for the results okay. but you were aware of other testing that had been conducted Correct. were you aware of uh, fingerprint testing latent print testing conducted on that item I hadn't reviewed results of that, but I was aware that some had been attempted. What does this image depict? It's just another um, more direct on from the side of where RL4 had been sitting, the, uh, the kind of the thick layer of staining. And again, this item? Again, this is RL4 um, going across, and then this uh, section that goes up, that's where RL3 railing had been. In this image. And this just continues on. This is where RL3 was. RL2 was 
um, down in this area. That's where the initial stain had been, and then RL1 would have been up in this area. Are you aware of whether there was a, a vent involved in the processing of this item? I, I was aware just from the team, but I had not viewed it. Are you aware of where the opening to that vent would have been? Yes, the opening of the vent would have been in this area. Um, there was metal grids coming out this way in the initial photos. You mentioned the Castle Meyer testing. Did you swab? Did you test? Did you use the Castle Meyer test? On, on I did. During your processing? And what's depicted in the image? So again, this is the part of RL4 that we were looking at predominantly. Um, it's showing my, my sample swab, and it's showing a bright pink result. So essentially, a swab was used, it was dipped in a sterile water, it was rubbed on the staining itself in that area, and then the Castlemeyer test was applied to it. And once the three drops, or uh, the couple of drops of the hydrogen peroxide were applied to it, it was an immediate pink. And can you remind the jurors what that immediate pink, um, what it told you? The, the faster it reacts, the more likelihood is it is that it's um, a positive versus a false positive. Detective Lamy, based on your processing of MER 3D overall, the, the portion of the ceiling that you, you processed, um, did you submit any of those items to DNA Labs International? I did. And what of those items did you submit? Um, that whole piece of sheetrock that remained after those other few that we looked at were removed was sent down as one item. The rails that came off, uh, RL1, RL2, RL3, and RL4, those were packaged separately and sent down as well. And let's talk about those rails, Detective Lemmy. When you removed the rails from the drywall, did you have any observations? So other than the, the darker staining like this that was present under a couple of them, once RL4, which was the long piece, um, and over the part that was more heavily stained, as soon as that piece came up off the sheetrock, there was a noticeable foul smell. And what, what was that smell associated with? I would speculate that it's from that stain itself. Detective Lamy, I want to switch gears and I want to talk about the ceiling itself. Um, we have portions of it here, and I'm going to ask that um, you remove and you have um, your evidence custodian with you, technician with you. Um, I'm going to ask that you, you remove them from the, their packaging to show to the jury. Um, and so, Your Honor, I would just ask if this witness be permitted to move freely with the evidence technician. Yes, you may. Go ahead. So, Detective Lamy, I'm just going to ask that you uh, remove certain items, and then I'd like you to identify where that specific item would be in relation to the scale that you do down this to maintain. And Detective Lamy, if you can start with uh, Exhibit 74, identified as MER 3D RL 13.
will be consistent with you. Specifically with respect to RL13, is that one of the items that was sent down to DNA Labs International in Florida? Yes, it was. While they're doing that, could you approach them just a little bit? Ask that you um, pick it up. I'm sorry to ask, but pick it up and just show it to the jurors if you can watch in front of you. Yeah, uh, actually, if you pick it up, I don't think it needs to be. Up. 
And Detective Lemmy, uh, you can set that down. Your Honor, I would move to mark what's been identified as, what's been marked for identification as States Exhibit 74 as uh, full, so strike the ID and publish. I, I missed doing that prior. No objection. All right. The ID is stricken. It's entered as a full exhibit. So, Detective Lamy, if you can just identify where RL13 is in relation to uh, to the sketch that you've drawn. Sure. And for the jurors, if it's difficult to see because it's low to the ground and you want to stand, you should feel free to do that, okay? As it was presented to you from that base view, what you saw was the cutoff from here over this way down to about this section. And that's what that bottom dark stain was from, was from here over to the edge. I would just ask if Your Honor would allow, if Detective Lamy can just point that out to the jurors there. He can, he can point it out, yes. If he's chair. Approach closer to the jurors. The on the board? On, with the board. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Just the condition of that, I didn't think Understood. it made sense to get too close. So, what you were seeing down behind the paper was the dark stain of emanating this way. Um, RL3 had been here. You saw a, a small jet out of dark stain, and the darker is in this section. And RL4 was this piece that ran straight across the move exhibit 74 I want to move on to exhibit 75 which is RL 15 
if it's the wrong number, that's fine. We can move on. Uh, can we go to what's been marked for identification as Exhibit 76? That's RL 15. butcher paper that we saw in the exhibit. That's what it was set on? The, yeah, the first photo that showed it sitting on the table partially open. All of that paper is what it came out of. Was that also submitted to the lab in Florida? No. And Detective Lemmy, while you're opening that, can you just describe for the jurors what, what this item is, RL-15? So this one is RL-15. The way I showed it to you earlier, <clears throat> RL-4 ran all the way across this way. RL-15 is the big thing to see why. This piece was not submitted to anybody for both. And if you could just hold it up for the jurors to see. Your Honor, I would move to strike ID and mark as full States Exhibit 76. Without objection. Right, the ID is stricken. It's entered as a full exhibit. Detective Lamy, I'd like to move on to uh, what's been marked for identification as States Exhibit 77. That's RL 16. Council, do you want to approach? And Detective Lamy, if you can just describe what this item is and where it came from uh, according to your sketch. So RL-16, I'll, I'll keep it consistent as far as how I was holding it for you. That item is running from here up to the end, uh, approximately down this way over. And RL-1 uh, railing have not been touching that particular piece because RL-16 is this area right here. 
And on your sketch, where is the vent area located? Vents down here. So this would have been a void, essentially. Yes. Okay. Um, let's move to the next item. That's. I'd ask that that exhibit be marked full, uh, ID stricken, and published to the jury. The okay. ID is stricken. It's entered as a full exhibit. It can be published to the jury. Detective Lemmy, I want to move to State's Exhibit 78, what's been identified as RL 11. Your Honor, the, the same with that item. I ask that State's Exhibit, what's been identified, marked for identification as State's Exhibit 79, that the ID be stricken, it be marked as full and published. Without objection. Sorry, you said 79. I'm sorry, 78. So, okay, 78. RL 11. The ID is stricken, it's entered as a full exhibit, and it can be published to the jury when it's taken out. the jurors what this item is and where its relative location is, was on that portion of the ceiling according to your scale. So we're going to same, same place to the location where the door would have the RL1. Okay. 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 Submitted to the laboratory for no one. Thank you, Detective. And if we can move to what's been marked for identification as State's Exhibit 79, that's MER 3D, State's Exhibit 79. is RL3 3A. So 79 remains for identification, is that accurate? That's correct. So I have 75, 75, and 79 remaining for ID, correct? Correct. That's your understanding, Attorney Brush? Yes, Judge. Okay. And while that's being opened, Detective Lemmy, if you can just describe where that item was collected from in relation to the sketch of the portion of that ceiling. RL3 is the middle of the room. RL4 Again, Your Honor, I move to strike ID, mark as full, and publish. Any objection? No objection. The ID is stricken on Exhibit 80. It's entered as a full exhibit, and it can be published to the jury.
rail, this is how the orientation would have been according to holding up the back chart, running down. RL4 was running across this way. And Detective Lamy, if you can just show them the underside of that rail. This is the side closest to RL4 that was running across. And was this item submitted to the lab in Florida? Yes, it was. Detective Lemmy, when you're ready, I'd like to move on to State's Exhibit 81, what's been marked as State's Exhibit 81 for identification. That's RL3, RL4, RL12. The idea is stricken. It is entered as a full exhibit. It may be published to the jury once it is opened. Detective Lamy, while that's being opened, can you please describe for the jurors where this piece of evidence came from in relation to that portion of the using the sketch that you found. This was actually... Um, uh, I, he, I, I'm sorry, he needs a microphone, please. So RL4 and RL12 were attached. We did not separate them when we processed this because we didn't want to cause any damage to what would have been underneath it. RL12 is this part that runs across the opening. RL4 runs all the way across. You mentioned a smell when you removed rails. Yeah. Is this the rail that you're referring to? Correct. Sorry, I wasn't near a mic. You mentioned a smell when you removed those rails. Was that the rail you were referring to? Yes, it was. This would be the orientation as we found it. This would have been the grid opening in RL4 and then the other pieces that were attached to it. Yes. Detective Lamy, was this item also sent to the laboratory in Florida? Yes, it was. And sir, when you're ready, if you would just retake the stand for cross examination. Good afternoon, Detective. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Jamie Brooks. I don't believe we've met, but I represent Adam Montgomery. 
I also have a few questions for you. I want to go back, though, to what was addressed during the beginning of your address examination. Uh, that's the blue Audi. Mm -hmm. You were involved in the processing of that? Yes, I was. And you mentioned earlier that the that there was evidence that was collected from the Audi. Correct. There, and that evidence was also submitted to the lab. Some of it. Let's let's talk about that. Some of it. And uh, again, how does a piece of evidence get uh, labeled? We typically have one. Uh, the detectives use their own initials and then we'll start at, if it's the beginning of the project and they haven't labeled anything yet it usually starts around one and then works its way up from there and when it came to the collection of evidence from the Audi there were a fair number of JP's correct yes JP standing for James Pittman and a number of those pieces of evidence collected uh, by Penman, uh, you decided to have submitted to the lab? Yes. And could you please tell the jury what particular items you had submitted to the lab? If I could review my report? You most certainly may. Okay. Actually, if I were to, are you familiar with something called a crime scene note? Yes. And what is a crime scene note? Well, a crime scene note is typically an overall um, write-up of the processing of a scene. I am going to, may I approach your honor? Yes, you may. what has been marked 2457 base stamps. Do you recognize that document? This was not created by myself. Not created by yourself, but it was a crime scene note from the collection of the Audi? Yes. And does that include the, uh, a list, an exhaustive list of the items collected from the car? It should. Would reviewing that help you uh, recall which items you had submitted to the lab? Probably not, because this wouldn't pertain any of the processing that was done after the collection. Um, there would be a lab submittal that I probably created, and that would list the items that I sent up. And that lab submittal would assist you? Yes. Judge, I think this would be a good time for a break. Uh, approach.
can review what has been marked. It has not been marked, but for bait stamps purposes, it's 3026. Do you recognize this document? Yes, sir. Would looking at it for a minute or two help refresh your recollection? Uh, only in terms of the actual evidence item numbers, what the physical piece is, I can't tell from here without okay. looking at photos or additional documentation. Okay. So, uh, well, let's stick with the numbers then. Okay. Having reviewed that report, what items did you have submitted to the lab for potential testing? 119, and these are all JP. 153, 195, 224, 251, 216, 225. So I understand that you may not be able to uh, recognize, for example, specifically what 119 was or 195, but those samples, the, the JPs collected from the Audi, uh, did some of those include uh, specimens from the floor mat? I, the carpeted floor mat that I tested initially with the hemostics? Yes. Those were different numbers. Those were um, JP 120 and 122. And those were submitted to the lab as well, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah. Do you recall a cash register receipt? I do. Could that have been one of the items submitted to the lab for analysis? I believe so. A shoebox? Yes. Blue bath towel? I would have to jog my memory about the bath towel. Detective, do you still have up there the casing note? Yes. And sir, what was the evidence item number for the bath towel? 153. Would you like me to read the listing as far as how Detective Heil listed it? Uh, just wanted to confirm that a blue bath towel was, uh, was sent to the submitted for analysis. So he, he, he identified it as towel with unidentified stains. He did not list the color. Cash register receipt. Do you recall having that submitted? I do. A pink sweater, women's? Yes, sir. A folder with papers? Number on that one, sir? Uh, take a look at 224 and see if that refreshes your recollection. Yes, sir. And uh, what is your recollection now? That 
was paperwork that was submitted. A gray bath towel. Does that mm -hmm. ring a bell? Number. 225. See if that refreshes your recollection. Yes. Um, towel with unknown stains. He did not reference the color. My photos and would show it, though. I apologize. I didn't hear that last response. The photos that I took during the processing would also help if you wanted me to clarify the color. Fair to say, though, that two bath towels were submitted for analysis. Yes, sir. Finally, uh, do you recall a length of twine? Yes, sir. And again, that was collected and submitted to the lab? Correct. I now want to turn to your use of blood stain reagents, latent blood stain reagents. Uh, in the processing of the Audi, you used Hemastix? Yes, sir. Kesselmeyer? Yes, sir. You were also involved in the processing of a Chrysler Sebring? I was involved in that as an assistant to the detective that was processing it. Detective O'Leary? Yes, sir. And when you were there assisting him in the processing of that Sebring, does January 7th of 2022 sound correct? I would be guessing. Okay. Uh, but he was using Blue Star? Yes, sir. I remember that. And that, again, is another latent blood stain reagent. It is. And whenever, regardless of which type of agent was being used, whenever there was a presumptive positive, it was collected. I can't speak to the Sebring because I didn't process that vehicle. I can only speak to the Audi. Okay. So when it came to the, the Sebring, were you there for the Blue Star? part of the processing of that vehicle on the 7th or no? I was there when we when he blue starred um, the trunk area. But it's your understanding that the practice, your practice, the practice of the Manchester Police Department is that when there is a presumptive positive, it is something that's preserved. If we did a swab of an area, we would typically preserve it. And that's what you did in the processing of the Audi, correct? Yes, sir. I believe, as you said on direct, that uh, you preserved the ability to be able to look further at an item if there was a presumptive positive. Yes, sir. And again, uh, you want to over collect as opposed to under collect. I do. I don't have anything further. Thank you, Detective. You're welcome, sir. Anything further? Just briefly, Your Honor. Detective Lemmy, I just want to follow up with the items that you were asked about on cross-examination by Attorney Brooks. Um, all of those items that you, you just identified, um, I think we talked about them on direct as well. Were they from the blue Audi that you, you processed? The particular one, numbers that we reviewed, I believe, were from the Audi. Was that the same Audi that was covered in mold? Yes, sir. And Detective Lemmy, let me ask you this. Um, do you know where that car was in 2020? I do not. How about 2021? I do not. How about 2022? I know it was in the evidence processing bay at Manchester Police. At some point? Yeah. Um, do you know who that vehicle belonged to? Um, I know that there was consent forms provided, I believe, by two different people. One of them was Donna Demers. Does, I'd have to review my notes to see the other one. And does Anthony Badero stand out to you, that name? It doesn't. Okay. Um, same questions with the, uh, the Chrysler Sebring. Do you know where that vehicle was in 2020? I do not. 2021? No. 2022. It had been in the evidence processing bay at Manchester Police. Thank you, Detective Lemmy. No further questions. No recross. All right. You may step down. Thank you, ma'am.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's just about 12.15, so a, a good time for our lunch break. I remind you, don't discuss the case with anybody. Don't watch any social media. Don't do any independent research. We'll come back in an hour, so please be back at 1.15. All right, 1.15, everybody. Thank you so much. do processing wise. I would ask that uh, Mr. Dido be able to repackage the items that we Okay, one, one, one. All right, they can do it now. I just ask them to do it expeditiously so the court staff can have a break as well. Okay, very good. Thank, Thank you. you.
hand over just raise your right hand. Do you swear that the testimony that you'll provide this jury will be the truth and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Okay. You can have a seat, Ms. Redwich, and make yourself comfortable. And when you're ready, if you could just start by stating and spelling your full name for the record. My name is Rachel Radwich. First is R-A-C-H-E-L. Last, R-A-D-W-I-C-H. Ms. Radwich, how are you presently employed? What do you do um, for a living? <coughs> oh, I work for the Manchester Police Department in the Evidence Division. And how long have you worked with the Manchester Police Department? Um, it'll be nine years this September. Um, in those nine years, have you held more than one position with the Manchester Police Department? I have. So I started off as a emergency communications dispatcher, and then after about two or three years, I began working in evidence as an evidence specialist. <coughs> and then as of last July, I was promoted to the evidence supervisor. And what are your current duties and responsibilities as an evidence <coughs> supervisor? So I primarily oversee the three evidence specialists that also work in my unit. Um, I oversee the intake and collection of all evidence that comes into the evidence division as well as maintain control of all of our storage rooms, um, ensure that all policies and procedures are being followed, um, and just keeping up with day-to-day -day tasks, completing requests, that sort of thing. You mentioned the intake of all evidence. And can you just walk the jurors through that process, how, how things are um, taken in by the Manchester Police Department? So generally speaking, either a patrol officer or a detective from the investigative division is the one collecting items from the scene or um, whatever they're working. All of our lockers or storage units for temporary storage have a one-way locking mechanism. So essentially the officer puts the item in once they lock it and secure it, only someone from evidence can access that item. From there, we maintain that the packaging used was the proper packaging to maintain integrity of that item. And then we decide on proper storage um, for long-term purposes for that, update the computer, make sure everything kind of checks out, and then put it away until it's needed for further analysis. Ms. Radwich, you just mentioned that the detectives will collect things. Are you, um, are you in a position where you go out and collect items? So on large scale scenes, um, my unit will be asked to assist, to include myself. And you also, you've mentioned evidence rooms, lockers, and storage units. Can you just describe those for the jurors so they're familiar? Um, are those all at the Manchester Police Department here in town? Yes, so primarily most of our rooms are at Manchester Police Department. Uh, we have about 12 rooms on the second floor, all under the control of the evidence unit. Um, it's limited access in, and then only the four of us in evidence can actually get into those rooms. Um, we also have some outside storage areas for things that can't be brought in, so like explosives, bicycles. Um, and then we have a room that's for ventilation. We call it our vented storage, so anything that isn't a drug item, which requires double security within the building, but still needs some sort of airflow due to the smell, um, that'll get stored in our vented storage. That way you're not bringing in something that stinks into the building to then permeate my office. So, Ms. Radwich, I want to back up for just a second, um, to be an evidence supervisor, does that require any, any specific training or education? Um, so it requires experience in the evidence unit. Um, I hold my Bachelor of Science degree in Forensic Science, as well as a Master's of Science degree in Criminal Justice. I've had training and certification through the International Association of Property and Evidence. And then there's also just on-the-job training um, that you get exposed to just through years of working in that division. And do you do continuing, or have you done continuing training during your nine years with the Man Manchester Police Department? So I s mostly stay up to date with um, case law, so local, state, and federal laws, make sure we're adhering to that. Um, stay up to date with our CALEA standards, which is accreditation for the police department. Um, make policy changes as necessary to reflect that. 
um, and then I keep up with um, you know technological advances we work closely with the New Hampshire State Forensic Lab um, as far as different analysis that they're doing um, keeping up with that Association for Property and Evidence um, as well as we work closely with the FBI and the ATF and kind of always maintaining a constant communication of where we need to be at to secure and maintain evidence. Now, Ms. Radwich, I'd like to switch gears um, and I want to talk about the case of a missing child, um, Harmony Montgomery. What was your role, just generally, your role and involvement on the, the case of, of the missing child, Harmony Montgomery? Um, so for this case, I was still an evidence specialist, so I hadn't been yet promoted. Um, and I had a few different roles within this, but primarily it was to assist the detective division for those large scale scenes, um, just to help maintain and document any evidence that's being brought in, um, ensure the integrity and packaging of those items. Do you recall when your involvement on this matter began? I, re I wanna say it was January, 2022, and at that point, it would have just been primarily the intaking and storing of items coming in. Um, at that point, it wasn't a full scale investigation to what it ended up being. Um, so just, you know, different interview discs, paperwork, that sort of thing we were collecting through those one way lockers and putting them into storage. And you mentioned earlier that you're in charge of intake of all evidence that's brought into the Manchester Police Department. Are you aware of whether or not evidence has been brought to the Manchester Police Department regarding this case? Yes, there has been a lot of evidence. When you say a lot, what does that mean? Um, about 900 pieces, give or take. Ms. Radwich, uh, during your involvement in this case, did you ship items from the Manchester Police Department to DNA Labs International? Yes, so we would take items being stored at Manchester Police Evidence Office, um, and I would transport it to a FedEx facility. Generally, we go to the one in Bedford um, and do standard express overnight delivery of those items directly to DNA Labs International in Florida. And I want to discuss specifically um, an evidence item bearing the, the evidence item number MER3D-RL1 through RL18. Are you familiar with those items? Vaguely. I know um, MER3D is the ceiling tile, um, and then anything with the RL attached would be any of the rails or screws that were removed from that ceiling tile. Um, and can you just describe for the jury um, how you became familiar with, with the ceiling portion, the rails that you just mentioned? Okay, so MER3D is a large piece of drywalled ceiling tile. There's a vent opening with metal rails. Um, I first became familiar with it when, of course, it came into my office and we needed to store it. Um, I was also part of transporting that item to and from the lab, um, the lab being the state forensic lab. Once that came back to my office, um, after testing was done at the state level, I was then overseeing um, that piece of evidence being reopened, essentially. Um, so that the analysts could get smaller cuttings for a deeper analysis, only because transporting that ceiling tile was just becoming too much. It's very large, required two people. Um, so it was decided that cuttings would be taken for further processing instead of transferring this massive piece back and forth. And let me stop you there. You said that the analyst made the cuttings. Yes. Were you there when, when the analyst made the cuttings? Yes. And what was that analyst's name? Kevin McMahon. And that's an individual from the, the lab? Yes. Here in New Hampshire. Uh, do you know whether he made specific markings on the areas that he cut? There were markings made next to the squares that were cut out. Okay. Um, following that interaction, did you have occasion to see that item again in your, your facility here at the Manchester, at the Manchester Police Department? 
Yes, so shortly after that time frame, that was mid to late June. Um, and then about a month or so later, we again had to pull the ceiling tile out and we brought it to our second floor training room essentially to remove the metal rails from the piece of drywall. Um, the reasoning for this is, again, it was really big, really bulky, um, and we wanted to see what was under those rails. Um, so I was amongst a team of detectives. We took the ceiling tile that was stored securely in the evidence division. We wheeled it down in its packaging to the training room, which was right down the hall from my office. Um, and then once there, we did what we needed to do to get those rails, rails removed. Do you recall with any specificity the other, the detectives that you mentioned? It was Sergeant Lovejoy, um, Detective Lammy, Detective Bombard, and Detective Rahill. That's Max Rahill? Yes. And so did you unpackage the item that day? You mentioned it was in July. Do you recall the specific day? I want to say it was the 18th. Okay. Um, so on July 18th, did you unpackage the item for the detectives? Yes. So once we got to the training room, um, we put down a clean piece of craft paper, put this item on top of it, um, and then just carefully open it up so as to not disturb the contents underneath. Of course, we had to use a knife to cut into it because it was wrapped in cardboard, um, given that it was drywall, so we didn't want it to bend and then break. Did you have any impressions when the rails came off of that item, of MER 3D? Yeah, so first looking at the ceiling tile, um, you could see some like dark staining on the, the drywall backing. Um, and then as the rails were being removed, you could see dark red, like crusted staining along the rails as well as slightly underneath. Um, and as the rails were being removed by the detectives, I could smell um, just a foul odor coming from that piece of drywall as the rail was being lifted. And uh, were you familiar with that foul odor that you smelled? Yes. And can you explain that to the jurors? How are you familiar with it, with the smell? Um, so the smell, I would call it like a pungent rotting smell. Um, and I'm familiar with that. And I would associate that with decomposition. Um, I know what that smell is like. I've worked on numerous crime scenes in which there was a body present. I've attended an autopsy. Um, and I've also regularly handle evidence that comes in from death scenes. At the Manchester Police Department, do you have a specific location for such items with uh, the body fluids de decomposition? So yes, that would be the ventilated storage. Um, but given the importance of this piece of evidence and the amount of packaging that was wrapped around it, again, it was there was layers of cardboard. Um, it was really maintained and sturdy. We kept that in our upstairs evidence room. That way it would be better preserved and the integrity would maintain through um, different weather changes, that sort of thing. I can have a moment. Thank you, no further questions of that lady, sir. No questions. You may sit down. Okay, thank you. All right. The witness is coming, and then I'll ask the, the interpreter to <coughs> step up as well. Thank you, Your Honor.
Sir. The interpreter has been placed under oath. A la interpreter. Uh, interpret to the best of her skill, knowledge, and ability. A la interprete se la ha puesto bajo juramento para que interprete a lo mejor de sus habilidades. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Mondrag. Uh, buenas tardes, señor Mondrag. If you could please stand uh, up for a moment, Si, por please. favor, se podría poner de pie. And if you would please raise your right si hand. Si puede alzar la mano derecha. Do you solemnly swear usted jura the testimony you give this jury que el testimonio que usted va a dar ante este jurado will be the truth Va a ser la verdad, the whole truth, la verdad completa, and nothing but the truth. Y solo la verdad, so help you God. Bajo la ayuda de Dios. Sí. Yes. Thank you, sir. Gracias. Please feel free to have a seat. Puedo tomar asiento. Mr. Mondrag, as we're being recorded here today, Señor Mondrag, cuando nos, ahora nos están grabando, would you please state your name and spell both your first and your last name? Por favor, este, nos podría decir su nombre y también deletrear su primer nombre y su apellido. Uh, Jared Brian Lujano Mondragón. Jared Brian Lungano Mondragón. Mm -hmm. y, y A R D. Uh, y A R D. And your last name, sir. Would you spell your last name, please? L U J A N O. Lugano L U J A N O. Okay. And you. Uh, is that your full name, sir? Y eso es su nombre completo, señor. Yes. Uh, sir, what town do you live in? Señor, ¿en qué pueblo vive usted? In Manchester. In Manchester. And how long have you lived in Manchester? ¿Y cuánto tiempo ha vivido usted en Manchester? Uh, 23 años. Uh, 23 years. 23 years, okay. Um, 23 años, okay. What do you do for work, sir? ¿En qué trabaja usted? In drywall and metal frame. In drywall and metal frame. Okay. How long have you done that kind of work? About 15 years. 15 years. If I could approach the witness, please, Your Honor. I'm here to show you what's marked State's Exhibit 30. Uh, Señor Lugano Mondrog, estoy aquí para mostrarle lo que se llama la prueba número 30. Uh, do you recognize this building? ¿Usted reconoce este edificio? Sí. Yes. Have you ever done work at this building? Uh, ¿Usted alguna vez ha trabajado en este edificio? Okay. Yes. What kind of work did you do there? ¿Qué tipo de trabajo hizo usted allí? Sheet rocking frame. Uh, sheet rocking framing. Do you know or have you ever met someone by the name of Adam Montgomery? ¿Usted conoce o alguna vez ha conocido una persona con el nombre de Adam Montgomery? No. No. And do you know or have you met with anyone by the name of Kayla Montgomery? ¿Y usted ha, uh, conoce o ha conocido alguna persona con el nombre de Kayla Montgomery? No. No. And that location where you did work installing sheetrock. Y ese lugar donde usted hizo trabajo instalando el sheetrock. Did you ever live at that address? ¿Usted alguna vez vivió en esa dirección? No. And other, doing, other than doing the work for the sheetrock, have you ever been back to that address? Uh, ¿Fuera de hacer ese trabajo con el sheetrock ahí, usted ha regresado a esa dirección? No. No. Right. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions for you. Defense Gracias. counsel may have no a few. tengo otras preguntas para usted, la defensa. And I have no questions. Y yo no tengo preguntas, su señoría. Your Honor, we'd ask the witness to please be excused then. A su señoría pediríamos que excusen al testigo. You are excused, okay. sir. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Gracias. Yes, thank you. And, Your Honor, at this time, the state calls criminalist Kevin McMahon to the stand.
Be careful of the wires, please, sir. And Mr. McMahon, if you would please remain standing for a moment and please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you give this jury will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank you, sir. Please feel free to have a seat. Good afternoon, Your Honor. Yeah. Good afternoon. And Mr. McMahon, there's some water up there for you if you need it, or if you need a break at any time, please let us know, okay? Thank you. All right. Um, would you please, because we're being recorded here today, state your full name, spelling both your first and your last name for the record. My name is Kevin, K-E-V-I-N, middle initial G, and my last name is McMahon, capital M-C, capital M-A-H-O-N. And Mr. McMahon, uh, up and until last year, where did, you, where did you work? I was formerly employed by the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory in Concord, New Hampshire. How long did you work for them? For over 40 years. And it's my understanding that you retired last year from there. Yes, I did. Okay. Um, what was your position while you were working at the lab? I was assigned to the forensic biology unit. Okay. And was there an official title that you had? Criminalist two. Okay. And what does that mean to be a criminalist two at the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Lab? Well, a, a criminalist one is a, an entry level position. A uh, criminalist two would be a more of a journeyman level position. Uh, or you have more responsibilities or more, more duties assigned to you than a criminalist one would. Um, I understand you, that you said that you were there for 40 years. Uh, what were the different units of the lab that you worked in during those 40 years? Uh, I worked primarily um, in the forensic biology unit, although um, way back when it was just forensic serology. I was actually hired as a drug chemist uh, but then uh, was transferred into the serology section. Uh, but over the years, I took on additional responsibilities, most of those dealing with the analysis of items of what are known as trace evidence, uh, which would include the examination of hairs and fibers, uh, the examination of paints and plastics, and the examination of automobile lamps. Uh, specifically the filaments in a lamp for purposes of determining whether a, a, a tail light or a headlight was on or off at the time of a collision. Okay. And Mr. McMahon, let me ask you, uh, what was, can you go through a little bit of what your educational background was, specifically in the area of dealing with serology and the identification of bodily fluids? Well, I hold both Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in Forensic Science from the University of New Haven in West Haven, Connecticut. And uh, both those programs were overseen by a fairly well-known forensic biochemists at the time. And so it would be difficult for someone to go through that program without having a lot of experience and exposure to uh, forensic serology. Um, and so in addition to what I learned about forensic serology while undergoing my education, uh, I underwent extensive on-the-job training uh, soon after transferring to the serology section of the lab uh, back in 1983. And could you please explain what forensic serology is? What is that the science of? So forensic serology is that area of expertise within the field of <laughs> Uh, the forensic sciences that deals specifically with the identification and the characterization of blood and other body fluids as they are associated with physical evidence. And it's the screening process which uh, in modern times immediately precedes DNA testing. In addition to your educational background, have you received any specialized training after you obtained your degrees within that field of serology? Well, over the years, I've had a, a number of opportunities to attend various schools and workshops and symposia uh, dealing with various aspects of forensic science, some of those specifically uh, dealing with uh, forensic serology. Are you a member of any professional organizations when it comes to serology or to um, detection? 
Well, I'm a member in good standing of the Northeastern Association of Forensic Scientists. And over your career, how many serological analysis or serology analysis would you estimate that you've made? Uh, serological analyses, I would estimate in the thousands or tens of thousands. Have you ever been qualified in court as an expert witness in the subject of serology? I have many times. And were those in New Hampshire courts? Yes. Okay. And does that include uh, this particular jurisdiction where we are today, Hillsborough County Northern District? It does. Okay. Your Honor, at this time I'd ask the court to please qualify Mr. McMahon as an expert in the field of forensic serology. Any objection? I have no objection to him giving his opinion. The court finds that he is qualified as an expert. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, uh, Mr. McMahon, what was your involvement into the investigation into the death of Harmony Montgomery? Uh, I was assigned uh, as the point person, at least as far as any requests that were made by the uh, Manchester Police Department for testing or examination of evidence for biological materials, primarily in this case blood or hairs. I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the evidence that you did do serology testing or at least examinations on in this case. It's my understanding that several of the items that you examined had no stain uh, that you saw, nothing to be tested. Is that correct? That's correct. There were a number of items that I examined and did not find any stains or deposits that I felt were characteristic of blood. And so no further testing was done beyond a mere physical examination. And then were there other I items that you looked at that you did test, but it turned out that they were negative for blood? Yes, sir. Okay. Were there also a, an item or two that you tested that was positive for blood? Yes, sir. Okay. So I'd like to start then, no understanding that those are three categories of, of things that you found. I want to start with some of the evidence that you tested that, you, that did not have blood on them, things that were examined and tested, but then did not have blood. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what pieces of evidence did you test uh, that you found out that they did not have blood on them? And I'd like to start s specifically with uh, items that you tested on January 5th of 2022, excuse me, that you wrote in a report on January 5th of 2022. And would you like me to refer to the uh, item names, or excuse me, the numbers that have been assigned to those items, or do you have a copy of your reports available in case you need to refresh your recollection? Uh, I have a copy of my entire case report, so um, you can either refer to the date of the report or the exhibit number so that I can verify what you're asking me. And let me ask you, did you sit through a deposition, uh, Mr. McMahon, on the same case? I did. And that the same file that you have with you today, is that the one that you had at deposition when you were able to answer uh, Attorney Smith's questions on that day? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, any objection, Attorney Smith, to having him refer to his notes? No. Okay. Um, so, Mr. McMahon, let me ask you specifically about a, a test that you did on an item listed as JMT8. Um, JMT8. And first of all, what was the description that you had for that item? Um, it was a section of um, automobile carpeting, not from the passenger compartment, but from the trunk of an automobile. And let me ask, we're talking about JMT-8. Uh, did you ever meet a detective by the name of Joseph Tucker from the Manchester Police Department? I'm sorry, what did you ask me? Uh, did you ever meet a detective by the name of Joseph Tucker from the Manchester Police Department? I did not. Okay. Um, the testing on JMT-8, uh, what were the serological tests um, that you performed on that and what were the results? Well, I performed a physical examination of this piece of carpeting by uh, putting some white paper, some bench paper down on my examination bench and then taking this uh, section of carpeting out of its original container, laying it out on the bench and examining it under the normal room lights. Um, and maybe with the assistance of a flashlight, it did not see any staining on there uh, that I thought was suggestive of blood. Uh, but knowing that dark colored substrates uh, like this carpeting, which was black, I then employed the use of an infrared light source it's basically a, uh, another source of light, but rather than white light that we use for room lighting, 
it employs infrared light and the image of the what the camera is seeing is projected on a, a computer tablet. Um, and during the course of this particular examination, I happen to notice a dark colored stain uh, that was not visible under normal room lighting. And I tested that for the presence of blood and that test was negative. Did you also test uh, another item um, with the same initials, JMT5, a t-shirt? I did. Okay, and w similarly, what were the results on the test on the T-shirt? Um, in, in that case, um, I performed uh, an, an analysis of a number of stains that were on that T-shirt, um, and I employed a test that would detect the presence of blood, and each of those tests were negative. And uh, finally, at one point, did you also, um, I'm, I'm referring to a report that you wrote on June 15th of 2022, or 13th was a correction on the 15th. Uh, did you ever do an examination of a piece of evidence entitled JD-47, an igloo cooler? I did. Okay. And what testing did you perform on that piece of evidence? Again, the, the testing always begins with a physical examination for deposits which you believe are reflective of or suggestive of blood. Um, there were a number of stains uh, on this particular cooler that seemed to resemble dry blood stains. Uh, each of those was tested chemically in the laboratory by myself, and each of those tests were negative for blood. Uh, with regards to that cooler, could you generally describe uh, what it looked like? Um, it's a large red igloo uh, portable cooler. Um, it has uh, wheels on it so it can easily be transported if it's full of ice or other things. Um, and it has an, a, a red body. It has a white lid on it and a white liner. And I believe it has a like a retractable black metal handle on it like a like a wheeled suitcase would. Yes. Mr. McMahon, I'm going to put down in front of you State's Exhibit 73. I'm going to lift the lid for a moment and just ask you whether or not you recognize the item that is inside. Yes, I do. do you recognize that item? That is exhibit JD-47, the igloo cooler. So this is the one that you tested? Yes, sir. And could you please just tell us generally, um, where did you test this item? Uh, if I might refer to my notes. Yes, please. Um, so I tested a number of stained areas, um, seven different areas. Uh, I'm sorry, did you say seven different areas? Seven different areas. Okay. Uh, one stain on the bottom of the base, uh, another stain on the right side of the base uh, uh, of the white top edge, uh, another stain on the red plastic base at the right front corner, Another stain at the left side of the base near the white top edge. Uh, the f let's see, the fifth stain was on the left side of the lid on the edge. Um, sixth was on the right front of the lid at the edge. And uh, the last, the seventh stain was on the right side of the lid at the edge. I drew a diagram to assist me in detecting where on the on the lid I actually and with regards to each one of those tests uh, were all of those in fact negative for the presence of blood yes sir Objection leading. what was your conclusion with regards to the test on those seven areas each of the results of each of the tests that I performed on those seven areas were negative for the presence of blood thank you in this case did Manchester Police Department ever inform you that some of the items that had been treated, for example, let's say uh, JMT-8, the stain in the trunk, did they ever tell you that some of these had been treated with a product by the name of Blue Star? Yes. 
And let me ask, does Blue Star interfere with the serological, serological testing that you do? In and of itself, it does not. Okay. Does it interfere with the DNA testing of these samples? It, it reportedly does not. What's the testing method that you use when you're testing for the presence of blood? Well, in the laboratory, I would use a test that's known as the Castle Mayer test, K-A-S-T-L-E-N-E-Y-E-R, Castle Mayer. What advantage, if any, does the Castle Mayer test have over a test like Blue Star? Well, the benefit of the Castle Mayer test over a test like Blue Star or some other tests similar to it is that uh, the Castle Mayer test enjoys a reputation of being both very sensitive and fairly specific. None of these blood detection tests are 100% specific, which means that occasionally they will provide you with a positive result, uh, but it's actually a false positive result. The result that you're getting that you would ordinarily think is positive is in fact a false positive and it's due to something in the sample that you're testing that you're unaware of. So with regards to the Castle Mayer test, is that the test that the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory uses? It is. Um, how long have you been using that test? How familiar are you with that test? I've been using the Castle Mayer test. Um, since college and on day one in my uh, introduction into forensic serology testing at the state police lab back in 1983. Does the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Lab use Blue Star? We do not. Why not? Uh, we prefer to use a different chemical for trying to find traces of blood at crime scenes. We use a chemical that's known as l luminol. And with regards to uh, the concept of false positives, could you explain what false positives are when it comes to uh, serology testing? Well, in, in testing for the presence of blood, uh, the tests that are available to us to detect the presence of blood all, all rely upon detecting the presence of hemoglobin. In order for a uh, a screening test or a detection test to be of any value, it must test for something that's unique in whatever you're looking for. And the one thing that's unique about blood compared to other body fluids is blood has hemoglobin in it where saliva and semen and other body fluids do not. So all of the blood detection tests rely upon detecting the presence of hemoglobin. Uh, and in the Castle Mayer test, we add a drop of a reagent that's made up of a chemical called phenolphthalein, and we look for a color change at that point. If, in fact, um, any of the known or well-recognized false positives are present in your sample, very often you'll see a reaction immediately after adding the phenolphthalein where you shouldn't. Um, it's only after the, adding the second reagent, hydrogen peroxide, should you see a color change. And in the Castle Mayer test, we're looking for the formation of a pink color. So if in fact I'm testing something uh, for the presence of blood and I get that pink color after merely adding the, the, uh, uh, the, um, the testing family. agent, um, uh, the phenolphthalein, uh, if I get a pink color there, that's a warning to me that the test isn't over yet, it's only halfway through, yet you're getting this pink color. And that would be considered a false positive reaction. It doesn't happen very often, but when it does, you're quite taken back because you're not expecting to see that color so soon. It's only after adding the hydrogen peroxide that you should see the color form if, in fact, blood is present. If no color forms, then you can safely conclude that blood is not present. The hemoglobin that you're trying to detect, what does the first part of that heme, what does heme stand for? Well, the hemoglobin molecule is fairly large and complex, 
and a major portion of it contains an iron atom. Um, and that's the heme portion of the hemoglobin molecule, the part that contains the iron. The part that contains the I iron. That's correct. Okay. I'd like to now move on to some of the other evidence that you tested, understanding that. Um, did you test a section of drywall and a T-beam framing in this case that you referred to in your June 13th and then 15th report of 2022? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, specifically, did you test a piece uh, that was entitled MER3D1, a piece of T-bar framing? Yes. Uh, did you also test a piece called MER3D-3B-1, a swab? Uh, yes. Okay. And also, did you test any sort of cutting from a backing of a piece of drywall? Yes, I did. Could you please explain to the jury how you came to examine this exhibit, made that cutting, and then made those tests, or conducted those tests? This large item of evidence uh, was submitted to the laboratory and was opened up by my colleague, criminalist Martin Orlowitz. Uh, he was preparing to process this item of evidence for latent fingerprints. But knowing that there was another request for looking for blood stains, uh, I was called over to conduct that examination prior to his analyses. And after I had examined that item of evidence, I had found several areas that I had suspected that were possibly blood. And so I went about testing uh, several of those areas uh, for the presence of blood using the Castle Mayer test. And each of the areas that I tested, tested positive for blood. Before you did that testing, you described before how you would do a physical examination of an item. Did you do that before you decided what areas to test? Oh, yes. Okay. And at any point, uh, did you label anything on that piece of drywall, on that backing? I did. So did the, it would be clear, if need be, down the road, like today, to know exactly where I tested uh, or I took my samples for testing Every area that I performed uh, a test on a sample from was numbered. Okay. Uh, numbered or lettered? Well, in the cases of the deposits on the metal frame, uh, they were each given a number. And then on the back side of the drywall portion of the exhibit, there was a very large discoloration a stain that consisted of light and darker areas. And I elected to test four different parts of that one large stain. And that got not only a, a number, but a number five, but also a letter, A, B, C, or D. Okay. A, B, C, or D, so it was four, correct? That's correct. All right. And uh, I believe, but if you could please go ahead and, and I think you may have already said this, what were your conclusions of testing those areas, whether they were positive for the presence of blood? Each of those areas and everything I tested in that particular exhibit was positive for the presence of blood. Um, you stated that you were working with somebody else that day at the state lab. Could you say that name again? Criminalist, that's his title, Martin Orlowitz. And uh, with regards to Criminalist Orlowitz, uh, what unit of the, um, of the lab does he work in? He works in the Pattern Evidence Unit. I'd like to ask the, the, some of the samples that you took or the, the parts that you were able to cut out and make cuttings, um, did you submit those for further DNA analysis inside the lab? Yes. Um, I swabbed the blood deposits that were on the metal frame because that was the most effective way of removing the blood from that metal surface by uh, transferring it to a swab that had been moistened uh, with something called digest buffer. As far as the stained area on the backing of the drywall, that had soaked into this very thin cardboard backing, and swabbing it would not have been as effective. And so what I did was I took a sterile, um, a sterile scalpel, and I very carefully cut out a small square of the darkest stain 
on that cardboard, uh, cardboard backing of the drywall. I put that cutting into a coin envelope and that coin envelope and the swabbings from the metal parts of the, the exhibit were forwarded to our DNA unit for DNA testing. How did you label that cutting that went to the DNA unit for DNA testing and how did you label the swab that went on for DNA testing? So the, 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 the cutting would have been labeled, if I might refer to my notes again. Please do. So as far as the, the metal swabbing, uh, and I only took one of, of the four that I had available to, available to me, um, I selected one as a representative sample, and the actual stain on the exhibit was exhibit MER3B, and because this was now a, somewhat of a child of that, this swab was now MER-3B-1. As far as the cutting is concerned, mm -hmm. again, it's the same exhibit, so it's going to be exhibit MER-3B. But this was uh, that large stain area, which I called collectively stain 5, but then subcategorized each of the four stains in there is A, B, C, and D. And so the stain that went on for, or a portion of it that went on for DNA testing, because I didn't cut the whole stain out. The stain was large enough that I could cut out about a one inch square from the middle of it and still leave the, the rest of it behind. That I identified as MER-3B-5A. Thank you. Um, the DNA testing that you sent it along for, did you perform that testing yourself or someone else? I did else? not. Uh, do you remember who that was that did do that testing? That was performed by my colleague, criminalist Katie Swango. And finally, uh, Mr. McMahon, with regards to, I, I know we talked about a couple of specific items. It's my understanding that there were many other items that you swabbed and checked uh, for serology. Is that correct? That's correct. And with regards to those, uh, were those either ones where no blood was found or that after a physical examination there was no stain to test? Uh, with regards to the physical items, not hairs. So excuse me, I think anything, anything other than the hairs that you were provided. So that would be correct. All the other items that I looked at, um, with maybe the exception of two, um, I either did not find blood on them or uh, my testing of what looked like it could be blood was negative. And with regards to the two that you thought that you might have uh, located blood, now let me ask, was one of them to your recollection a sweatshirt or a portion of a sweatshirt? I think it was a portion of a sweater. Okay, a portion of a sweater. If yes. you could refer to your notes, I just want to make sure that we're clear. Yes, the, the two items that I'm referring to are exhibits JP216, which is a pink sweater, and this is detailed in my report dated April 21st. And JP216, so that's the first two initials there are JP, is that that's correct? That's correct. Okay. And with regards to that sweatshirt, uh, 
do you know what kind of uh, vehicle that came out of? Whether or not it was a, a, a an Audi that that came out of? Are you do, aware of that? I don't know what the source of where the item was collected from, but it's a sweater. Sweater. Okay. And was there? You said there was one other item. Could you please right. tell us what that one was? The other one was JP two fifty one, which was a length of twine. And that also was a, a JP. I believe you said those initials. Yes, sir. Okay. And do you know uh, whether that came out of a blue Audi or do you? Similar to your last answer, you don't know where that where that uh, item came from. I do not know. All right. If I can just have a moment, please, Your Honor. Yes. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <clears throat> One of the, you, the New Hampshire State Lab has a separate DNA lab, right? That's correct. And do you do DNA? I do not. Okay. And one of the reasons that things don't go directly to DNA is DNA kind of costs a lot of money, and you want to make sure that the testing is of something that may produce a DNA result. That's correct. The vast majority of evidence that comes to the laboratory with a request to check for blood or semen or saliva typically goes through a serological examination first. And if we find something, um, usually only a portion of the original item gets forwarded on for DNA testing, not the entire item. We'll cut a stain out of a garment or, or out of a piece of drywall, like I just explained to you. Um, when I don't find any type of a biological material, uh, then that's where the analysis ends. Okay. And nothing would go on to DNA. Right, because if it doesn't get through you, there's likely not DNA. That's correct. And that a DNA test would be a waste. That's correct. So, um, that's not always the case that it goes through you, right? Well, the vast majority of it is subject, the vast majority of the evidence is subjected to some sort of a serological analysis by either myself or a colleague of mine. Okay. There are some items that would go straight to DNA, like a known DNA sample of one person or another. There's no need to perform any analysis on an item of evidence, which is a known sample from a known individual. Okay. I'm going to show you a copy of what's been marked as State's Exhibit 10. Have you seen this object before? I have not. Okay. Um, and this is a full exhibit, Your Honor. Yes. A toothbrush. So there's been testimony about DNA tested in the lab and results found on the toothbrush, why was it that that didn't go through you? I'm not sure if I can answer that. I could only surmise that um, for serological or biological testing, the area of interest in that particular item is so small. We're not looking for DNA on the parts of the handle. We're looking for DNA only on the part that goes into the person's mouth and makes contact with their teeth and gums. And that that was so small, and the fear would be that there would be very little DNA present because it's a small surface area. And so rather than wasting sample on a serological test, because we're going to do DNA testing regardless. Let's just reserve all of the sample for DNA testing. There are a few situations where uh, even though my testing is negative, the item still goes on for DNA testing. And that's a few situations and it's only done because we recognize that the sensitivity of the test that I perform is much lower than the sensitivity of a DNA test. So when I swabbed the mouth of a bottle that was left behind at a crime scene 
and I test that swabbing for saliva and it's negative, that swabbing would still go on for DNA. And essentially, um, we are talking about saliva and that the area of interest on the toothbrush would be saliva. Right? That, that's correct. And so pretty much no matter what, that's going to the DNA lab. Yes, ma'am. And um, so this isn't simply a procedure where people are doing things by rote. You actually consider the possibility of whether testing might uh, consume DNA before DNA can actually be tested? That's correct. And if there's the possibility of that, you're going to send it straight for testing so that your tests don't consume or have any effect on the DNA that might be present? That's correct. To make sure that if it's there, it's going to be found? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, uh, there, you had some testimony about JMT evidence, uh, with the, starting with the initials JMT? Yes, ma'am. And that was a section of black carpet, a child's t-shirt, and a child's pajama pants, right? Um. Go ahead. Yes. Okay. And those, I think you were aware, were found in the trunk of a car? I believe so, yes. Okay. And the same area where the toothbrush was found? That I'm not sure I was aware of at the time. Okay. And um, so you tested each of these items and they were all negative for blood? That's correct. And you talked about the testing that if you saw a stain that looked like it might be blood, then you would take the next step and do some screening with the chemical. That's correct. In the black carpet, because a stain might be there and you might miss it, you do extra tests, right? Right, that's when we re-examine the item using the infrared light source, that's correct. So you don't assume, okay, I can't see anything, you're gonna make sure that it's not there. That's only done when the color of the substrate, the surface that possible blood is on, is dark enough that it might, by virtue of its dark color, uh, interfere with my ability to see the blood stain. Um, items that are lighter colored, it would just get a standard physical examination under normal room lighting. So the... Um Next step, after you question, perhaps there's something there, you do that castle mayor, mayor um, testing. And the black section of carpet from the trunk was negative for blood. The um, child's T-shirt, you uh, checked that for, um, you examined it by sight to check for stains, right? That's correct. And you found several. Yes. And you tested them to see if those stains were just child stains or blood? Well, I, I'm not sure I would describe it that way, but there are a, a number of stains on a, a green sweatshirt. Turquoise, perhaps? Okay. I wasn't exactly sure which one you were speaking about. All right. JMT5? Okay. I was thinking of another item, but yeah. Um, I conducted an examination of it, um, again, if I might refer to my notes. Uh, I conducted a physical examination of this child's t-shirt, and because the sleeves of the t-shirt were dark blue, the body of the shirt was this turquoise, I conducted an additional physical exam using the infrared light source and looking for additional staining on the sleeves. And uh, so that was negative for the presence of blood. That's correct. And then there was uh, a pajama pants, a child's pajama pants found in the same area? That's correct. And well, uh, I'm not sure where it was the collected location? from. Okay, sorry. Um, JMT6, uh, that one, you didn't have to go to the Castle Meyer testing, right? I did not. 
because you could see the item well enough to determine if there were stains characteristic of blood? Well, in this case, like some of the other items, uh, these pajama pants were dark gray in color. And so after examining them under normal room lighting, I conducted a re-examination using the infrared light source, and I didn't find any staining on these pajama pants at all. So it, it, it's pretty fair to say that if there's a question in your mind, you take another step. If one is available. So then you did several items that uh, had the initials at the beginning JP. Yes. And there's been testimony before uh, you that JP would, and you understand that the initials reflect the officer that um, has collected and um, bagged or whatever the evidence. I do. That's, that's a common practice in law enforcement. And there has been testimony that that was JP referred to an officer Pittman. And these items were from the Audi. Did you, were you aware of that? At that time, no. Okay. And um, same sort of testing to determine whether or not there was a presence of blood. That's correct. And if there was a question, question in your observation, you would take the next step and check for um, either a light source or the Castlemeyer. That's correct. And uh, the results were a little bit mixed. Some you f did not find the presence of blood. Some you had to do additional uh, screening for blood. That's correct. And two items I think that you testified of, let's see, one, two, three, four, About 15 items that were JP something. Do you want me to double check your math? We can do approximates if you want. Well, excluding hairs. can only find nine that are JP. Hmm. Are you looking at uh, your report of 1-2022? And then yep, four there's two items there. Pardon? Two items there. 4 22 oh, The next one's one twenty six twenty two. Yep, those are the hairs. Okay. And then uh, four twenty one twenty two. Seven items there. Seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen. Total. But you're including the hairs. Yes. Okay. Fourteen. Okay. Good thing. Fourteen in total. Okay. And um, speaking of the hairs, uh, you found one specimen, and it's a JP hair, one specimen suitable for DNA analysis and send it on, right? With respect to JP185, yes. And then uh, with respect to JP202, a couple of hairs to go to the DNA. That's correct. And... Um, other hairs didn't actually have any DNA in them. Well, I, or you couldn't detect. No, <laughs> I guess for the remaining hairs, uh, based upon my microscopical examination of the hairs, I had determined that they were likely unsuitable for a DNA analysis. Okay. So then you also testified on direct about a pink woman's sweater, screening uh, positive for blood, right? That's correct. 
a length of twine, which was JP251, screening positive for blood? That's correct. And uh, you sent those two on for DNA analysis? That's correct. And um, if these items were found in a motor vehicle that had been sitting out in the weather for a very long time, subject to heat, subject to cold, and subject to mold, apparently, you were still able to find uh, presence of blood on those items. That's correct. And environment can degrade uh, blood or DNA? Possibly, yes. And it may not? That's correct. And so the fact that something has been in the environment doesn't mean that any blood that's been there has degraded? That's correct. And the fact that something has been subject to heat and cold doesn't mean that any blood that had been present would be degraded? That's correct. Thank you. I think, uh, one moment, Your Honor, please. Oh, and one more thing was you talked about the area of dry paneling that was uh, sent on to the DNA lab as well. Drywall paneling. Yes, ma'am. Paneling, ceiling, I don't know what to call it. Drywall, uh, you have it as drywall paneling, right? Yes, ma'am. And if there's testimony that this was um, taken from a ceiling, would that be consistent with your description? Yes, although um, I, I couldn't describe it in my notes or in my report as a part of a ceiling because that's assuming I, I knew where it came from and I can't take that assumption into account. So I just describe what it is as it's presented before me. Thank you. On that last uh, line of question you just asked about uh, not being able to take it for granted that the drywall that you saw necessarily came from the ceiling, uh, is that something where to be able to say that you'd have to talk to the person that actually took it from the ceiling or took it from a wall? I'd either have to be there during its collection I'd have to get um, its source or from where it came from, from someone whose opinion I trusted. Uh, or a third option would for it to be described uh, that way when it was uh, submitted to the laboratory on the paperwork that's submitted with evidence. But I'm still um, the, the final say for how an item is described. It, that may have come from a ceiling, and I'm, I'm certain it probably did. It's just that that wasn't so apparently obvious to me uh, that I had to describe it as what it actually was. Thank you for that. Two other quick questions for you. Uh, you asked a moment ago about JMT5, the T-shirt, and I believe you described how um, on cross-examination that the sleeves were darker that dark substrate that you talked about earlier, and that's where you use the infrared light. That's correct. Uh, did you make any notation uh, the fact that that t-shirt was a size for an 18-month-old? I did make a notation in my notes um, where, where I can about, um, you know, the garment manufacturer's name and the size. Um, And again, I'm referring to my notes. Um, I described exhibit JMT5 as a blue slash teal long sleeve t-shirt. Um, and uh, furthermore, it's, it's a children's long sleeve t-shirt with a turquoise colored body and dark blue sleeves. Uh, the brand name is Just One You and the size was 18M. Um, about the toothbrush with regards to that, that going not through serology but directly to, to DNA. Um, 
DNA, and I believe that you were asking whether or not the toothbrush would have saliva on it, uh, that, is, that small part of the toothbrush would have saliva on it. Um, do you recall that question a moment ago? Uh, to some degree, yes. Um, in addition to the saliva, would it also have chi cells or other cells from the gum or the lining? It's inferred that it would. I mean, it's a, it's a, a motorized toothbrush. Assuming that we use it in the fashion for which it was intended, uh, it's reasonable to expect that the end of the toothbrush that you would insert into your mouth could bear deposits of saliva, and that saliva would contain cellular material from the gums or from the cheeks of the mouth. Thank you very much. I have no further questions for you. Thank you. Just also very, very quickly. Um, the uh, turquoise child's long sleeve t-shirt you said was specifically what age? 18 months? Well, it said 18M on the fabric label. Okay. So, um, toddler-ish. I assume so, yes. Okay. And the pajama pants, similarly? Uh, may I look at my notes? Sure. Uh, one pair of dark gray fleece children's sleep pants with a red, white, and black winter holiday pattern. Uh, the brand was Holiday, uh, pound sign or hashtag if you will, Fam Jams, F-A-M-J-A-M-S, size XS4-5. And I take it you're not going to interpret what that size means, but it's extra SS. small. Okay. And I'm, I'm guessing four or five in, in children's clothing typically refers to the approximate age okay. of the child that would wear that size clothing. Okay. And the pink sweater was an adult woman's sweater. I believe so, yes. Okay. Thank you. Any objection? Yes. May I be excused? You may. But you, sir, you may step down. You are excused. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, it's 2.30. Uh, perfect timing for our mid-afternoon break. So I remind you, don't discuss the case with each other. Don't do any independent research. I'm going to ask the witness, if you would, just to stay there for just a moment so I can let the jurors go. We'll see you in about 15 minutes. All rise for the jury, please. can step down. Council for just a minute.
Yeah.
Please rise for the jurors. Please be seated. State may call its next witness. Thank you, Your Honor. The state calls Martin Martin Orlowitz. This jury will be the truth and the whole truth under the pains and penalties of perjury. I do. Thank you. You can have a seat. Make yourself comfortable. Mr. Orlowitz, can you start by stating and spelling your full name for the record? My name is Martin Orlowitz, M A R T I N O R L O W I C Z. And Mr. Orlowitz, how are you present here for? I work for the state of New Hampshire uh, State Police Forensic Laboratory. What's your uh, current position with the forensic laboratory? I'm a latent print examiner. And how long have you worked for the state of New Hampshire State, the New Hampshire State Lab? Since October of 2019. And prior to that, any experience with the forensic laboratory? I worked uh, from October of 2016 to July of 2019. I worked for the state of Alaska Scientific Crime Detection Laboratory. And how long were you with the Alaska State Crime Lab? Uh, between October 2016 and July 2019, so almost three years. What was the role that you held while you were working, uh, while you were employed at the Alaska State Crime Lab? Um, I was doing latent print processing as well as crime scene processing for the lab. And when you say crime scene processing, uh, what did that look like when you were at the Alaska State Crime Lab? Uh, the crime scene processing that I did for the state of Alaska was a um, accessory role where law enforcement would call for and assist if they needed um, specialty work done at a crime scene, searching for fingerprints or tire tracks or blood, those sorts of things. And was that for the entire state, so all the way from Utiavik up north to Ketchikan down south? Yes, it was. <clears throat> You also mentioned latent print analysis. Yes. And did you do that in your current role or in your role with the Alaska State Crime Lab or both? Um, my role in Alaska was more specifically just latent print processing, which was evidence processing to search for uh, latent prints or fingerprints as they're more colloquially known. In New Hampshire, I do the second portion of latent print processing, which is the analysis and comparison. And which unit? For the state of New Hampshire, um, which units have you worked in? Uh, the name of my unit is the Pattern Evidence Unit. What are your primary duties and responsibilities in that unit? In New Hampshire, I'm doing latent print processing, so processing evidence to find fingerprints or friction ridge evidence, as well as doing the comparisons, so analyzing any uh, impressions that I find to determine if they're of value for comparison and then comparing them to known record impressions to see if I can determine the source that they may have come from. Mr. Orlowitz, what areas uh, do you specialize in at the state lab? Uh, just fingerprints. And I want to talk about your, your background, your training. Uh, can you tell us what your educational background is? 
I have a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of New Hampshire in biology. Uh, that's my educational uh, experience. Outside of that, my training specific to my duties. Um, I went through roughly a six-month program in the state of Alaska to learn how to process evidence for latent prints. Uh, and then when I moved to New Hampshire and started at the lab here, I went through roughly another 10-month training program um, to do the analysis and comparison portion. This training program is sort of like a, re a residency program, so it's shadowing personnel who are already employed at the laboratory while doing my own independent research and study in those areas to become competent. And then there's final competency exams before I'm allowed to do any independent work. You mentioned your bachelor's of science. What year did you obtain that degree? Uh, 2015. Um, I want to talk about the state, the New Hampshire State Police Training Program for Friction Ridge Detail. Are you familiar with that program? Yes. And can you tell the jurors what it is? So that was uh, the residency program that I was just describing. So it's an in-depth program where any trainee, myself included, who goes through is learning about um, friction ridge processing analysis and comparison for an extended period of time in order to become competent in the field. And Mr. Orlowitz, do you hold any, do you currently hold any certifications in your field? I do. Can you tell the jurors what that is? I have a certification from the International Association for Identification for latent print examining. Can you also tell the jurors what you have to do to become a latent print examiner? In order to, uh, there's an application process to take the certification test. So I had to put together a packet um, showing my experience and training in the field, as well as showing that I was currently employed in the field and doing latent print comparisons. I believe the um, certification mandates that at least you have to have at least two years experience doing latent print comparisons before you can take the certification test. So that was submitted to the certification board and then when they deemed that I met the qualifications for the test, they sent the written and practical portions of the test which I completed and passed. When did you obtain that certification? What year? 2021. And. Mr. Orlowitz, about how many fingerprints would you, would you say you've examined, you've personally examined over the course of your career, both here and in Alaska? Thousands. Is the New Hampshire State Police Forensic Laboratory accredited? Yes. And can you tell the jurors what that accreditation is? Uh, our accreditation is through the um, American National Accreditation Board. Uh, it's a third party company, essentially that reviews any work policies um, at our laboratory and makes sure, makes sure that they are meeting industry standard and then also makes sure that we are adhering to those policies in our day-to-day -day work. Uh, they come through every four years for an on-site review and every two years, I believe, for a document review to make sure that we can hold our accreditation for the laboratory. And Mr. Orlowitz, as part of your role with the, the lab, uh, do you have to undergo continuing education? Yes. And can you tell the jurors what that is, what that requirement is? Uh, so in order to maintain my certification through the IAI, I have to have a minimum number of continuing education credits uh, in each four-year period between my certification tests. So I'm routinely searching for new courses to help bolster my training and experience. Uh, that in regards to latent prints. How often do, would you say you, you undergo those, those new courses that you mentioned? I'm actually in one right now, so fairly often. Fairly often. <laughs> yes. Mr. Orlewitz, have you ever been qualified as an expert in fingerprint and palm print analysis at a, in a superior court here in New Hampshire? Yes. How many times? Uh, once that I remember off the top of my head. And how about a superior court in Alaska? Uh, not for fingerprint analysis, no. Um, Your Honor, at this point the state moves to have criminalist Orlowitz qualified as an expert in the field of fingerprint and palm print identification. Any objection? I have no objection to him giving his opinion. 
the court finds him so qualified. Mr. Erlerowitz, before we move on, I want to talk about, uh, I want to teach the jurors exactly what fingerprint palm print analysis is. Okay. Um, have you had an opportunity to look at several uh, slides, uh, demonstrative slides? Yes. Do you feel like those slides would aid the jurors in understanding what you do, exactly what, what it is that you do? Yes, I do. Your Honor, at this point, permission to publish a several slides related to the May we approach? Yes. No. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Rolowitz, just to clarify, the demonstrative photos that you you reviewed prior to testifying today, nothing to do with this case, is that correct? No, uh, as far as I know, they're just stock images of fingerprints or friction ridge skin. So, Mr. Rolowitz, what is a fingerprint? A fingerprint uh, or friction ridge skin is the skin that's on the grasping surfaces of your palms and your fingers, as well as on the bottoms of your feet and your toes. Its name implies its function. Friction ridge skin provides friction to those surfaces of your hands and your feet in order, to, in order for you to be able to better grab things. And uh, what are some of the basic fundamentals in fingerprint, in, in the science of fingerprint and palm print analysis, identification analysis? So 
two of the basic fundamentals in fingerprint analysis and comparison are that the friction ridge skin that you are born with is unique to you. So any, any individual has unique patterns and flows of friction ridge skin across their hand. And then the other uh, fundamental is persistency of that detail. So the details that are present in your friction ridge skin should persist throughout your life barring any catastrophic change. And the image, the images that are depicted on the screen there, what do they depict? These two images, the, the image on the left shows a fingerprint, uh, specifically the distal phalange of a finger, the one furthest from the palm. Um, it's showing the friction ridge skin present on that. And then the photo on the right is showing a palm print or a portion of the palm print. This portion of the palm is called the interdigital palm. It's just underneath where the fingers meet the palm and it's showing the friction ridge skin there. Can you tell the jurors what a, a latent, latent impression is? Latent impressions are, rather than your physical skin, your friction ridge skin, a latent impression is a chance impression that might be left behind when an individual touches an object. So the residue that is present on your skin may deposit itself onto a surface, leaving a copy, essentially, of your friction ridge skin on that surface. It can also be the inverse, where if a, a surface is dirty, your friction ridge skin could lift up the contaminant that's on that surface, leaving almost a negative image of your friction ridge skin behind. Can you tell the jurors what a known impression or a known print is? Known impressions are, they're also referred to as exemplar impressions or record impressions. So these impressions are, are taken anytime someone is fingerprinted. These are a known recording of an individual's friction ridge skin. Traditionally, these were done with ink by rubbing ink onto someone's finger and then rolling that finger on a piece of paper to record that. Now there's digital systems that capture the same information. And how are fingerprints deposited onto an item? So again, latent prints, they're, it's a chance recording. So there's a possibility of when someone touches something that friction ridge details can be left behind. If some of the residue that's on your hand stays on the surface or if residue that's on the surface comes away on your hand. So is it like what you'd see on TV where if someone touches something it always leaves a fingerprint? Not always. There's a variety of factors that may inhibit deposition of friction ridge detail. Uh, the, the easiest one that I can think of is if someone was wearing gloves. When I work in the laboratory, I wear gloves so that I don't leave fingerprints on the things that I'm working on. That's the easiest way to inhibit deposition. What determines, <clears throat> other than the gloves, what determines whether fingerprints are left on an object? <clears throat> uh, there's other types of surfaces that are very difficult for fingerprints to be left behind on. So for instance, clothes, these types of porous surfaces, they don't hold friction ridge detail or fingerprints very well. Uh, surfaces that do hold fingerprints very well are nice, smooth, non-porous surfaces, or things like pieces of paper, the adhesive side of tape, those things hold fingerprints very well. It also depends on environmental factors. So if the surface is very wet, the likelihood that a fingerprint may remain uh, goes down. If a fingerprint may also be deposited, but then later be washed away if it's raining. So there's a variety of factors that go into deposition. And how long do fingerprints generally la last, remain on an object? <clears throat> That's, it's difficult to say exactly how long a fingerprint may stay on an object. Uh, again, it depends on environmental conditions. So if, um, to give an example, if a fingerprint is left on an exterior window in the baking sun, and then it rains the next day, and then we go through some New Hampshire weather, and it snows, or we have a nor'easter, there's a higher chance that that fingerprint is going to be washed away or wiped away than, say, a fingerprint <coughs> that is inside a house on a metal fridge that gets touched you know, every day. Um, likely there will be fingerprints there much longer. I want to switch gears just a bit. Once you receive a, uh, once you've received a fingerprint, how do you how do you go about an anal analyzing it? <coughs> when I'm looking at fingerprints, I'm trying to analyze any of the information that's present within them. So the information that I'm looking at is a macroscopic 
to a microscopic feature. Uh, generally, we describe these as level one, two, and three detail. <clears throat> Mr. Orlowitz, <clears throat> how is an identification made and a comparison conducted? Um, a comparison is conducted by taking the analyzed latent impression and then comparing it to known impressions or a record impression to determine if there's the same source or if they're not the same source. Uh, an identification specifically is a <coughs> conclusion that can be rendered if, I, if it's my determination that the latent print and the record impression have enough detail uh, in similarity in order for me to say that they came from the same source. And so the screen shows this methodology ACE. Can you describe that to the jurors? This is the analysis, comparison, and evaluation methodology that I use on every case that I work. This is the methodology that most latent print examiners uh, in the field use. So <clears throat> analysis is, again, assessing the detail, so assessing those macroscopic and microscopic features, those three levels of detail. Once that's done, I would move to the comparison phase, comparing the latent impression that I analyzed to known record impressions. And then my evaluation is my final conclusion of my comparison phase. So whether I identify the print, which is, as I said, when, I, when it's my opinion that the two impressions came from the same source, or if I exclude the print, meaning that the latent impression and the record impression, I believe, are from different sources, there's a third conclusion I can come to called inconclusive. This conclusion is used if the record impressions that I have available to me are too low quality in order for me to definitively say whether the latent print came from them or did not come from them. Mr. Orlowitz, can you walk us through that identification process and the different levels of detail that you're looking for to make a comparison? So during my analysis, uh, again, assessing the details present in the latent print, I like to think of it as starting with a macroscopic view of the impression and then moving to a microscopic view. There's three levels of detail. Uh, the first level of detail is ridge flow. So how the ridges themselves are flowing across the finger or across the hand. Uh, in fingerprints specifically, there are three pattern types that are typical to see. Um, there is an arch pattern type, a loop pattern type, and a whorl pattern type. Um, those are helpful in determining anatomical source and orientation. If I can see a pattern type, I can determine this likely came from a distal phalange portion of the finger, and I can usually determine which orientation is up on that, which direction would be up on that latent impression. Um, because all I'm assessing it with level one is the ridge flow, I, I would not make an identification just based off of that ridge flow. Lots of people in the population share pattern types. So a lot of people have whorls, a lot of people have loops, a lot of people have arches. That's a, a macroscopic detail. But the microscopic detail, the level two and three, is where I can begin to make an identification. So let's discuss level two detail. The level two detail is ridge path formation or deviation. So this is moving from looking at the entire latent print to looking at one single ridge at a time. And what I'm determining and looking at in my analysis is where these ridges are ending, where they're splitting, where there's smaller ridges. So I'm searching for attributes specific to each ridge. A grouping of these attributes uh, can be used to identify a latent print to a source. And so I see bifurcations up there. Can you describe what that is for the jurors? Uh, bifurcation would be um, where a ridge splits from one ridge into two ridges. A ridge ending is exactly what it sounds like. It's where a ridge ends. And then a dot or a short ridge is just a very small segment of ridge instead of a longer portion. 
And can you uh, just identification process in terms of level two detail? What, what are we looking at on this slide? So this is um, this photo is showing specifically those three features that I just mentioned: bifurcations, ridge endings, and dots. Uh, it's pointing them out in the greater ridge flow in the larger image and then zooming in to show you the exact feature in the smaller images. Let's discuss level three detail. Level three detail, this is the most microscopic level of detail that I use during my comparisons. This level of detail goes from looking at a single ridge to looking at the exact characteristics and attributes of that one ridge. So where the pores are present on top of the ridges, what the edges, the edge shape of the ridges look like. Uh, this level of detail is not commonly recorded in latent impressions or record impressions because it is so microscopic. Uh, but when it is present, it is highly discriminating and highly useful in identification and exclusion decisions. Um, can an identification be made in all cases? No. And what does it mean if you cannot find a fingerprint when you're during your analysis? Do you mean um, if I don't develop any on evidence or? Correct, yes. Um, so if no fingerprints are developed on evidence that I'm processing, uh, I, I can't say whether or not that item was touched or had ever been touched. Uh, like I said before, there's a large number of factors that go into deposition of a latent print as well as uh, if that latent print remains on the surface. And I have no knowledge or control of those factors before the evidence gets to the laboratory. So if a fingerprint or a finger or friction ridge is not um, observed on one of the items you're analyzing, does it mean that that was not touched? No. Um, and I think you touched on this earlier, but speaking generally, what variables may cause a fingerprint not to be detected on one of the items that you're analyzing? Uh, the fingerprints may be uh, wiped away over time if, a, if an object <laughs> contacts another object. Uh, or if something is cleaned, um, as well as environmental factors. So latent print residue is a combination of waters, um, fats, amino acids. Over time, those things degrade, they evaporate. So uh, there's a potential that the print could itself just disappear. Mr. Ullerwitz, I want to switch gears and discuss um, State v. Adam Montgomery. Um, did you conduct analysis in this matter? Yes. And what did you process? Uh, I processed five items of evidence that were submitted to the laboratory for latent print impressions. Um, and I want to begin with an item with the evidence number JD47. Does that item stand out to you? Yes. Uh, what was that item, or what is that item? I remember that item being a uh, red Igloo brand cooler. Do you think you'd recognize that if you saw it today? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes, you may. So, Mr. Orwitz, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as States Exhibit 29. Do you recognize that item? Yes, I do. And what's depicted in this image? This is uh, JD47, the red Igloo brand cooler that I processed at the laboratory. Is that a true and correct copy of the, of the item that day? Yes, it appears so. Your Honor, uh, the state moves to strike the strike state's exhibit 29 for identification. No objection. If the ID is tricky that's entered as a full exhibit, it may be published. And so if you can just point to, let's talk about this. Did the item arrive 
in your laboratory that way, appearing as it does in this image? To my recollection, yes, it did. And um, are there stickers placed on this item? There are, yes, several. And had this item, at the point that this image was taken, had undergone op um, analysis? I don't recall if it had gone through um, my laboratory analysis at this point. Uh, I believe, I don't, I don't want to speculate on that. Um, I don't recall if that was before analysis, but I believe it might have been. I'm showing you what's been admitted as State's Exhibit 20A. Okay. Having seen this item, does that refresh your recollection on whether or not image State's Exhibit 29 had undergone analysis? Again, I, I don't, uh, I don't believe it went through latent print analysis before that image was taken. Okay. Um, at some point, did it? Though? Yes, it did. And you conducted that analysis? Yes. And again, you identified it in the photograph there. Would you recognize that item if you saw it today? Yes. been marked for identification as State's Exhibit 73, and I'm just going to ask that you stand. Do you recognize this item? Yes, I do. Is this the item that you conducted testing on? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. How do you know that it's that item? Uh, I recognize the item from when I processed it. Uh, I also believe if it's the same packaging um, or the packaging is present inside from when I analyzed it at the laboratory, my initials should be on a evidence tape seal. It looks like it may have been repackaged since I processed it. So this is a true and correct. This is the item that you would Yes, it is. Your Honor, I move to strike that view of State's Exhibit 73 as being evidence of all. Any objection? No objection. The ID is stricken. It's marked as a full exhibit. May I publish? Yes, you may. Mr. Erlowitz, you mentioned processing that item, analyzing it. What were the results of that analysis? I did not find any 
uh, friction ridge detail on that exhibit. No friction ridge detail. That's correct. <coughs> Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. Mr. Olowitz, I'm showing you what's been marked for identification as States Exhibits 109 through 135. And I'm just going to ask that you review each of those items in turn and just look up when you've had an opportunity to review all of them. Yes, I do. And how do you recognize These are images uh, that I took or generated in relation to my latent print processing and analysis and comparison for this case. Are those true and correct uh, photographs of the images or the items that are depicted? Yes, they are. Your Honor, the state moves to admit and publish. So strike ID for states exhibit what's marked for identification is items 109 through 135. No objection. All right, the ID is stricken. They're entered as a full exhibit. <clears throat> so Mr. Orlowitz, switching now to um, the white metal ceiling, uh, it's MER 3A and 3D. Uh, So metal ceiling, a vent, and a section of drywall. Did you have an opportunity to analyze those items? Yes, I did. And based on your analysis, were you able to develop friction ridge details for those items? Uh, I was able to document friction ridge detail on MER 3D, which was a section of drywall with metal framing as well as MER 3A, which was a ceiling vent, a white ceiling vent. And um, did you denote those friction ridge details in any particular way? All of the friction ridge areas that I documented were designated with an L number, so L1 uh, and so on and so on as more would be documented. And was that L1 through L13? Yes, it was. And so the image that we're looking at now, what, what are we looking at there? This is an image that I took to show the uh, rough location of the first area that I, does, that I documented, L1, on exhibit MER 3D. So where the small adhesive tag with the uh, ruler on it is, that's the rough location 
of L1. And if you can just point that out on the screen there, Mr. Rolowitz. And so does that item, that sticker that you just pointed to, does it say something on it? It says L1 on it, it's labeled. And is that just another photo of L1? Yes. And what does this image show us? This is showing the rough location of the next two areas that I documented, L2 and L3. Uh, they are similarly documented, doc, yes, labeled as L1 with the small adhesive scales in this area. Yes. And those are the stickers that you mentioned? Yes. What does this image show us? This is showing the location of the next three areas that I documented, L4, L5, and L6, with their related labels. This is a, a different angle of those same three areas, L4 through L6. Can you just point to the jurors or see? This is L4, L5, and L6. And what is this item? This is exhibit MER 3A. Uh, this is that ceiling vent. This is a photo that I took to show the location of several um, designated areas that were on, uh, I, I guess I would call it the underside of it, so the, the side that would typically be in a ceiling, uh, not the visible side of it. And can you identify in that photograph just each of the areas that you designated? Adam? The areas present in this are, <coughs> excuse me, uh, L7, L8, L9, and L10 in that corner. Um, there's another tag over here, but I'm not sure what the uh, designation is on that one. Focus on L7 through L10. So this is a closer view of those same four areas from that uh, front left corner in the previous photo. And just for those in the back that can't see, can you just point out? Again, L7. L8, L9, and L10, the furthest. Which of those items had sufficient uh, details that you can compare them to known impressions? Uh, during my analysis, I determined that some of these areas had multiple sections of ridge detail in them. So they were subdivided out. So instead of just being L8, uh, I subdivided out to L8A through L8E, for example. So five impressions in that one area. <clears throat> of all the impressions that were present in this case, um, L6, L7B, L8A, L8D, L9, L11, L10A through L10C, and L13 were all determined to be sufficient to move on for comparison. Okay, and this is showing States Exhibit 116. I wanna take a look at the prints that you found beginning with, you mentioned L7. Um, I, wanna, I wanna look at that first, and, um, and so it's blown up here. If you could point out L7 again. The friction, friction L7 is in this area. Okay, and what did you do with L7? How did you analyze it? So again, um, moving back to how I described the analysis phase before, uh, L7 particularly was two impressions, so I sub-designated those L7A and L7B. Um, looking at the details present, the level one, two, and three detail present in those two impressions, L7A, I determined, was not identifiable, so I would not be moving forward with that impression to comparison. There's not enough detail present in it that 
that I believed was reliable to make any sort of uh, conclusion with. L7B, on the other hand, uh, I determined to be identifiable based on the detail present in it. And just for those that can't see, can you point out those items, L7A and L7B? L7A is the impression on the left of the photo, this area here. L7B is this impression on the right of the photo, this larger area. And what analysis did, this, did those impressions undergo? So uh, the analysis that I'm doing for all of these impressions is the same as I've described before, looking at the three levels of detail, documenting detail that's present in them, uh, particularly when I'm marking up an analysis image like this, I will mark level two features that are present, or if there are reliable, what I believe to be reliable level, level three features that are present in the impression, I'll mark those up as well. So I'll put like a small green dot at the end of an ending ridge or at a bifurcation or around a dot. Or if there's a section with pores that I can see, I could shade that a different color. And I can use that group of features later in my comparison. And can you show us where you did that in this image? And this, that for the record is referring to States Exhibit 117. There are very small green dots at the end of these ridges or these bifurcations that are present in this image. And the large line at the top, what does that indicate? The, um, in, in my field, we would call that a horseshoe. The horseshoe line at the top of the impression means that I have deemed it to be identifiable. So any impression that has a horseshoe over it, it's, it's denoting two things. One, that I've determined that that is a fingerprint impression specifically, so from a finger as well as that I believe it's identifiable. And what is written next to L7A? Next to L7A is NI, is written NI, which stands for not identifiable. With respect to L7B, what was your next step in that analysis? The next step after analysis uh, would be my comparison. Okay, and let me stop you there. When you were analyzing the items that you received, did you have anything to compare those items to? Any known, any known samples, known prints? Um, when the evidence uh, came into the laboratory, I was not supplied any known impressions to compare to. Um, okay, and I believe you're gonna say the next step of your analysis, and I'm moving to States Exhibit 118. What is this image showing us? This is uh, my comparison chart. So this shows the latent image from the evidence on the left-hand side. And then the image on the right is from a record impression or exemplar impression. <coughs> Excuse me. So comparing the feature, I'm in this image, I'm marking features that I marked in my analysis onto the record impression to determine if the two have enough similarity in order for me to establish an identification. And then I would create this chart showing the areas of correspondence that led me to uh, my identification conclusion. Were you able to identify the person that deposited that print? Yes, I was. And who, who was it that you identified? Adam Montgomery. And can you show the, the jurors the comparison? Stand up. Yes.
Mr. Orlowitz, at some point during your involvement on this matter, did you receive known prints for Adam Montgomery? Yes, I did. Did you receive any other known prints? Uh, I also received known prints of Kayla Montgomery. And I believe you, you said you made a comparison and you received a result. Can you remind the jurors what that result was? Yes. Uh, for this latent L7B, I identified um, the left middle finger of Adam Montgomery as the source. And how many levels of detail are present in this analysis? In this particular analysis, the levels of detail that I used were level one and level two. The level three detail present in the latent impression was spotty or non-existent at best. Um, and so not much of it was used, not much or any of it was used for the comparison phase. And when you say L1 and L or L2, that's level one or level two? Yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just want to be level one and level two. I'm sorry about that. Um, and again, you, you mentioned level three being rare. It is rare, yes. Let's take a look at another print that you found. I want to focus on L8. Can you point the jurors where this L8 is? L8. So I'm showing what's been published or admitted and published as State's Exhibit 119. What does this image show us, Mr. Rolowitz? This is a photograph that I took of uh, the latent area, L8. So there are multiple impressions present that I further sub-designated during my analysis, but this is a photo that I took during processing of that exhibit. And those sub-designations, do you recall what they were? Yes, they were L8A through L8E. And does this image show an alternative light source? It does, yes. Can you tell the jurors what that is, why you use it? Uh, an alternative light source is a forensic lighting application that is typically used in conjunction, at least in the laboratory, with a dye stain or some sort of fluorescent chemical. What this enables us to do is remove background color or pattern from the evidence in order to better visualize friction ridge detail that's been developed on that item. And now this is State's Exhibit 120. What does this show us? This is another, this is my analysis image of L8A through L8E. And, and what was your analysis? What was the results? Were you able uh, to develop? Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> my initial analysis was that three areas were identifiable, L8A, L8C, and L8D. I believed to be identifiable. L8B and L8E I determined to be not identifiable. I would not be moving forward with those to comparison. During the course of my analysis, I reanalyzed L8C and determined that the detail present in that was not enough for me to reliably move forward with that impression to a comparison. So I determined that L8C was also not identifiable. And so now L8A and L8D are identifiable impressions. And how did your analysis proceed with those items? Um, the same analysis methodology that I've been describing. Um, these were all determined to be, the well, L8A and L8D were determined to be fingerprint impressions, thus the horseshoe over the top of both of them. Uh, so I would be comparing fingerprints to these. And who did you compare those, those two? Who's I, I compared Adam Montgomery to these impressions. And were you able to identify uh, L8, the L8A friction ridges from MER3A? Yes, I was. And who did you identify those two? I identified those to Adam Montgomery. Which finger of Adam Montgomery? Uh, I believe the left middle. And how many levels, with respect to L8A, how many levels of detail were present? Uh, I'm not 
I'm not sure. Without looking at my chart, I'm not 100% sure. But um, in any latent impression, any of the three levels of detail can be present and can be used for a comparison. In most of these impressions, um, I was using level one and level two detail to arrive at my identifications. With respect to L8D, were you able to identify friction ridge details from, from that item? Yes, I was. And who did you identify as the, the source of those? That? I identified Adam Montgomery. Which finger of Adam Montgomery? The left little. Let's look at, let's look at another uh, print that you found, this one L9. Um, this is States Exhibit 121. Can you tell us what we're observing here? This is my analysis of L9. This impression I analyzed to be a simultaneous deposition, meaning that both uh, areas present in this image are from one simultaneous touch. Both fingers came down at the same time and left these impressions. I determined that based on the angle of contact as well as deposition um, distortion present in the images. So this is a identifiable simultaneous fingers impression. Can you show the jurors how that would occur using the screen there? The simultaneous if impression. Two fingers come down at the same time. In this case, at a higher angle of contact, both impressions would be left at the same time. And how is this analyzed? How did you analyze it? As I said, this uh, I analyzed this to be a simultaneous fingers impression. And um, who did you compare L9 friction ridge details to? I compared this to Adam Montgomery. What were the results of that comparison? Uh, I identified Adam Montgomery, uh, specifically his left middle and left ring fingers, as having made this simultaneous impression. And I'm showing you States Exhibit 122. What, what is that showing the jurors? This is my comparison chart of L9. So the latent impressions are the images at the top of the screen, and then the known record impressions are on the lower section. You mentioned that these are Adam Montgomery's fingerprints. Which finger specifically from Adam Montgomery? Specifically the left middle and left ring fingers. I want to look at another print that you found, so I'll draw your attention to L10. Um, did you have an opportunity to analyze L10? Yes. And can you tell the jurors how you analyzed it? L10, I determined to be three separate fingerprint impressions. Um, these fingerprint impressions, uh, I decided that they were not simultaneous because of the angle of deposition and the uh, almost impossibility of deposition simultaneously due to anatomical position of the fingers on the hand and the directionality that these were deposited in. So these were all designated separately, L10, A, B, and C, and they're all horseshoed at the top to show that they're identifiable fingerprint impressions. Okay, and the image that you just pointed out that has horseshoes at the top to show that they're identifiable, um, that image, uh, you did those horseshoes at the top, is that correct? Yes, That's I did. part of your analysis? Yes, these, the analysis images uh, with any markings on them, I'm, I generate those at the laboratory as part of my analysis. And here we're referring to States Exhibit 123. Did you have an opportunity to compare those items uh, to any known prints? Yes, I did. And whose known prints did you compare them to? I compared these to Adam Montgomery. And I want to go through each in turn. So let's start with L10A, and I'm showing you uh, States Exhibit 124. What does this show us? This is my comparison chart, the latent being on the left side, the known being on the right. Um, this is my comparison of L10A to Adam Montgomery's left middle finger. And Mr. Orlowitz, what was the result of your comparison of L10A? This was an identification to Adam Montgomery. Do you know which finger of Adam Montgomery's? The left middle. I'm showing you what's uh, been published as States Exhibit 125. What does this image show us? This is L10B, again, a comparison chart of the latent on the left, the known on the right, 
showing my identification conclusion. Who did you compare L10B to? I compared it to Adam Montgomery. And what were the, what were the results of that comparison? I identified L10B to the left index finger of Adam Montgomery. I want to turn to States Exhibit 126. What does this image show us? This is my comparison chart for L10C, latent on the left, known on the right. Uh, this shows my identification conclusion for that impression. And what was your conclusion for that impression? I identified L10C to Adam Montgomery's left little finger. I want to look at another print you found. I turn your attention to L11, and here I'm looking at States Exhibit, States Exhibit 127. What is this image showing us? This is um, one of my processing images from processing the item of evidence, MER 3A, that this latent L11 came from. Uh, this is just showing the latent in its entirety. And how did you process this latent? Uh, this latent itself, are you referring to the chemical processing or? The chemical processing. Chemical yes. processing. Uh, this latent itself went through a process, uh, well, this item itself, I'll, I'll say, went through a process called lumicyano fuming. So it's a super glue fume that when, um, when heated up will polymerize on top of friction ridge detail present on an exhibit, present on an item and it will leave a white residue, very light white residue on top of the ridges. This helps preserve them. It also helps make them more visible. Lumicyano also combines a fluorescent dye. So um, it can then later be visualized with an ALS, which I mentioned earlier, to help better visualize any prints present on that exhibit. I'm gonna to move to States Exhibit 128. What does States Exhibit 128 show us? This is my analysis image of that latent L11. After analyzing L11, did you have an opportunity to compare it to any known prints? Yes, I did. And I'm turning to States Exhibit 129. What does States Exhibit 129 show us, Mr. Horowitz? This is my comparison chart of L11. L11 was analyzed to be a palm print, not a fingerprint. So this is my comparison chart of L11 to Adam Montgomery's left palm. What were the results of your comparison, Mr. Orlowitz? I reached an identification conclusion for this. And who, and who did you identify as the person that deposited that palm print? Adam Montgomery. And I'm sorry if I missed this, but which palm print was it of Adam Montgomery? The left palm. Mr. Orlowitz, I want to look at another print that you found, um, and I want to turn your attention to L13. This is States Exhibit 130. What does this image show us? This is L13. This latent was also present on MER3A. This is another processing image from that exhibit, from that evidence. Did you have an opportunity to analyze this? Yes, I did. And how did you go about analyzing it? Uh, my analysis for this, I determined that this was a latent fingerprint impression um, in the opposite orientation from what you see in this photo. I'm turning to States Exhibit 131. Um, what are we looking at here? This is my analysis image of latent L13. The horseshoe for this latent is near the bottom of the image. So this is telling me that I believe this is an identifiable fingerprint impression, but also showing that my theoretical directionality of up for this would be this way, actually, so that the finger, if you can imagine my finger on the screen, it would be in this orientation. Did you conduct a comparison of L13? Yes, I did. And who did you compare that item to? Adam Montgomery. And I'm turning to States Exhibit 132. Um, what is this image showing us? This is my comparison chart of L13. So latent on the left, known on the right. 
this shows my identification conclusion to the right index finger of Adam Montgomery. I want to look at the final print that you found. So I want to turn your attention to L6, and this is States Exhibit 133. Did you have an opportunity to process States Exhibit 1, sorry, States Exhibit 133, so L6? Yes, I did. And how did you go about doing that? Uh, this, the exhibit that L6 was on was MER 3D. This evidence was a large piece of drywall with metal framing on it. It was roughly uh, five foot by six foot. It measured about that. Um, I did a super glue fume, so similar to the Lumi Cyano fume that I told you about earlier, but without the addition of the fluorescent dye step. <clears throat> so this was just with a super glue fume uh, in order to process for these impressions. Were you able to analyze this item? Yes. And I turn your attention to States Exhibit 134, which I've put up on the screen. What does that show us? This is my analysis image of latent L6. So I determined that these four touches, these four areas of friction-rich skin on this exhibit were one simultaneous impression. So all four of those fingers came down at the same time on the exhibit and left those four impressions. Following your analysis, did you conduct a comparison of L6? Yes, I did. And who did you compare L6 to? I compared to Adam Montgomery and Kayla Montgomery. And what were the results of that comparison? Uh, both of them were excluded as having been the source of this impression. And did you conduct further uh, comparisons on this L6? Uh, after reaching those exclusion conclusions, I ran this impression through our automated biometric identification system, or ABIS system, which is a repository of record impressions from um, local systems as well as national systems. So I turn your attention to States Exhibit 135. What does this image show us? This is my comparison chart of L6 to um, known impressions of an individual who was a candidate on the, um, the search list that ABIS sent back to me after performing the search against the records. Uh, this candidate's name was Yared Luyano Mondrag. I identified um, this impression as having originated from that source. So after looking at the entire ceiling paneling, the, the vents, there were only two individuals you were able to identify as having the positive prints on those items, is that correct? Yes. And can you remind the jurors who those two individuals are? Adam Montgomery and Yared Luyano Mondrag. Um, are you aware that Yared Mondrag, Mr. Mondrag, was the drywall installer? I was not aware of that. Thank you. No additional questions. When you're ready, Attorney Smith. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A uh, couple of questions. One about the um, fingerprints that you just testified about identifying uh, in a comparison to a person. Yes. Okay. Um, you got a high degree of certainty that you've identified the right people, right? Yes. And um, for especially in some of those fingerprints that had that level three? Um, I don't recall specifically using level three in any of my comparisons. Um, they were also done in June 2022, so my memory may be a bit off. 
in any event, um, a very, very high degree of certainty that Adam Montgomery's fingerprints were found on the mental ce metal ceiling vent and then some on the on the and the metal um, that held the drywall together. Yes. Right? And then um, the other was uh, somebody completely unrelated. Yes. Okay. So let's go back to the cooler. When you analyze the cooler, um, did something happen while you were analyzing the cool before you started your analysis of the cooler? Did somebody come in and do something in front of you? Uh, Kevin McMahon, who was a serologist at the laboratory at the time, performed a serology examination on the cooler. Okay. And this cooler, um, right now it's pretty dirty, right? Yes. And it's dirty because of the uh, tools that you use to look for ridge detail, right? Yes, I believe that's a portion of the residue that's left on that is from my processing. Okay. So the reason that you would want somebody like a Kevin McMahon to come in and do serology is that you might actually be changing the condition of the cooler. Yes, there's the potential that any processing I do could um, dilute or remove biological, biological uh, evidence that's present on an exhibit. So in, in the laboratory in general, and specifically for this case, serology would be conducted prior to latent print processing. And the reason, well, uh, and again, you do this so that if there's evidence on this cooler, it can be found. Whether yes. Whether serology or fingerprint. Yes. Um, the other uh, is that you talked about different surfaces being good for fingerprint. Yes. Is this cooler and I can bring it to you. I can put a glove on and bring it to you if you'd like. That's okay. Okay. Is this cooler good for that sort of um, finding rich detail and stuff? The, the exterior of the cooler is uh, textured, which is not the best type of substrate or surface to uh, retain fingerprint detail. Um, like I said before, smooth surfaces are usually what's best. So I can go and I can touch this cooler at the top and um, you may not be able to find my ridge detail. That's correct. Okay. How about the handle? So, same thing? It's metal-ish. Uh, there's, there may be a potential to find um, friction ridge detail on something like that handle. Um, it's smooth, but it, it being a handle gets handled a lot, which could potentially wipe off any friction ridge detail that was deposited prior. Okay, and that was going to be my next question. An object that is touched a lot might remove, smear, or change any ridge detail below it, right? Yes, it, it may remove it completely. And so you get an accumulation at some point and you, you may not even be able to identify the last person touching. That's correct. Um, the metal ceiling vent and the drywall, did that go through a similar um, serology <coughs> analysis before your fingerprint analysis? Yes, they did. And that was separate. It wasn't actually in your portion of the lab, right? N right, that's correct. Okay. And um, there's another item that you tested. Uh, do you recall? Um, there was a small pink child's cup. I believe the uh, agency item number was BEO25. Okay. And um, nothing there? No, no friction ridge detail was documented or developed on that. Okay. And was that a good surface to find fingerprints? My recollection was that the exterior of the cup was fairly textured. There were some. Uh, flat portions, but much of that cup, I think, was a textured surface. Okay. So is it fair to say that um, none of the items that you tested uh, raised a suspicion that they had been wiped or cleaned off? No, I, I did not have that suspicion during my testing. Thank you. Uh, da, da. Thank you. I just want to follow up on that last point. 
How would you know? How would you be able to see if, if things were wiped off? Um, during my processing, if wipe marks or drag marks became visible during the processing, that could uh, potentially cue me off that something had at least been wiped across the surface. And that wasn't present on the items that you, you analyzed? I did not observe that. Um, with respect to the highly textured surfaces that you mentioned, how would you see those drag marks on a highly textured surface like the, the cup that you mentioned or the cooler there? Um, it would. It would be very difficult to see if any white marks were present on a textured surface. Thank you. No additional questions. Okay. But it's fair to say that you saw nothing to raise that suspicion. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. All right. You may step down. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've reached the end of our day today. I remind you, don't discuss the case with anybody, not with each other or with anybody else. Don't watch any social media, read any newspapers, uh, look at any online coverage of this case. Avert your eyes. Um, so we'll begin again tomorrow morning. Please be here at 8.45 for a 9 a.m. start. Don't do any independent research. Thank you so much for your uh, significant attention today. Uh, have a good evening, ladies and gentlemen. All rise for the jurors, please. All right, everybody. Um, we'll see you in the morning. I don't know uh, if we have somebody who's incarcerated who's coming. You're going to let me know before I say oh, call your next you witness. Ask. Yes, of course, Your Honor. Okay. Um, I think there's just the one individual for transport for tomorrow. Um, I don't know yet the order of the day. Um, we have two of the witnesses planned for today. We need to go back and read to figure out that order. Okay. We'll okay. We'll make sure that that person gets on and off. Okay. Oh, you can you can all be seated. Um, just one last uh, observation. It seems that there are some things that are being marked that either you've ha you may have had marked subsequent to the original marking for identification that hadn't been shown to the defense. Maybe I'm misreading that. I just seeing you bringing things over that are, you know new to the list I just want to make sure are you seeing the other than that fingerprint issue are you seeing everything in advance I think that there were some things that were marked this morning that we hadn't realized so I just want to say if you if you know you're going to be using something and you're having our court monitor mark it make sure that they see it okay I think that's important just then we're not uh, they're not seeing it for the first time when it's being introduced um, okay anything else no very, no, Your Honor. very good. Thank you, everybody. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. I was thinking you said.